good afternoon. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are uh, gathering here on Tuesday to finish the second half of what um, had been on our agenda for Friday, but we had not had the chance to get to because of an extended floor session. And so um, what, just a little recap for where we are so that we can sort of bracket this conversation. Um, we had an opportunity to hear responses and reactions to the, um, the governance proposal that we put on the table last week. And we also um, started our um, testimony on hearing responses to the uh, plan design proposals. And so this is part two of, of uh, individuals giving testimony to respond to the plan design changes that were uh, put on the table last week. And just to remind folks who are following along at home, these, this was uh, just a, a first uh, a first effort at opening up a conversation about whether the uh, benefit structure um, should be looked at as part of the solution for why we are seeing uh, such an increase in our unfunded liability in our pension system. So we've got some folks who are with us today who were very patient on Friday and didn't get a chance to talk with us. And so I think I'll go first to Beth Pierce. There she is. There she is. Hi, Beth. I thought I was uh, someone else was in front of me on the on the schedule. My apologies. So, well, first I want to say thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to speak to, with you about it. And uh, uh, this was a serious effort. And I want to say thank you for all the good work. Um, it uh, obviously is something that uh, when we did our um, uh, recommendations, we did so with a great deal of reluctance. And I know that you share in that, recognizing that these are painful. Um, but there is a real need to move forward and to move forward this year. Um, I um, saw the, uh, the, the recommendations at the same time others did last week, and we are looking at how it looks in relationship to our plan. But ultimately, it, uh, it's now in the General Assembly's court, and uh, we're, we're trying to look at those um, uh, recommendations as you move forward and, uh, and appreciate the opportunity to listen to the, um, uh, to the public hearings uh, thus far. I did have a couple of points. As I said, we're still trying to digest some of the material, but uh, uh, the first is that in the presentation, it's stated uh, with respect to pre-funding OPEB, and, I, and I, the quote was, to the greatest extent possible. And my comment there would be that we need to commit to this now, uh, especially since the next bullet in the presentation makes the uh, case for pre-funding. And as I said before, 10 years from now, we do not want to have another, how did we get here conversation. So we believe that, uh, that prioritizing uh, the funding of both OPEBs, uh, other post-employment benefits, primarily healthcare, um, is very, very important as we move forward. And it's, uh, it's fairly straightforward and we would uh, recommend uh, that uh, uh, immediate uh, steps can be taken to, uh, to get that done. Uh, the second uh, is with respect to the implementation data or the effective date of the changes. And that's not in the presentation, but I did wanna make a statement on that. Our office has stated to employees that they should have time to review their options. You know, we've gotten uh, uh, questions and, um, and uh, uh, on these changes. And what we said is, frankly, uh, there is no proposal that uh, has been finalized. It's still in discussion, um, but uh, that uh, we would expect and we would advocate for sufficient time for uh, folks to review their options. And I, I know that, uh, uh, that there's anxiety already with the proposals and the, uh, and, uh, the recommendations either from, your, uh, from my office or, and, uh, and those in your, your pre package. Um, but and to, and obviously it's, uh, there's anxiety and that's uh, you know, to state the obvious there. But we don't need to add to it by leaving, out, uh, leaving questions about when the changes will take place. And I assume that the, uh, and I assume, uh, that the General Assembly has the same position that employees need to have um, sufficient lead time to assess, their, to assess their personal needs and impacts and make, the, uh, make informed decisions. So I would urge you to, um, to get that statement out there as, um, as quickly as possible. Uh, the third point I would uh, make is on revenues. I was pleased to see that the new revenues were included, 
uh, and from what I can see from the presentation, um, it seems like it could be applied to um, uh, any of the, the two retirement systems or the uh, two uh, remaining buckets, the so-called buckets, the uh, two OPEB funds, uh, and uh, looking for uh, how that all sugars off at the end. But in looking at the presentation, it said that, um, uh, that $50 million invested today would grow to 153 million by 2038 based on uh, the current amortization table. And if it grows at, uh, at 7%, our, um, our assumed actuarial rate of return. And I took a look back and in 2018, uh, we made a similar um, uh, recommendation. Uh, we um, we um, uh, worked with the General Assembly and uh, they, uh, they created a, um, uh, a proposal and, and actually backed it with appropriations. I believe it might've been in a budget adjustment, of, but effective, uh, effective for 2020, that essentially put $26.2 million of additional funds. Um, and the concept was the same, that you would calculate the ADEC as if those funds were not included. So essentially you're earning interest on those dollars. And our calculation at the time was that doing this uh, would um, uh, would uh, generate another $78 million. Uh, it seems to be very close in terms of, uh, uh, you know, on a one-to-one on a, a -one ratio with uh, what you ha uh, what JFO has in its presentation. And uh, that was in fact done uh, the uh, for the first year, the uh, ADEC uh, recommendation uh, included that, and that was included in the 2020 budget. However, uh, in 2021, uh, that uh, uh, that approach, which was continued to be rec uh, was recommended by the trustee board, was not included in the governor's budget request, nor was it restored by the general assembly. So we had one year of a plan and um, and moved back to um, I guess uh, <coughs> status quo um, subsequent to that. So I don't think we want to go down that path again. So if there is a clear earmarking of of those uh, revenues, and if that is in fact the intent to uh, to generate. Uh, additional revenues instead of um, 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 further bringing down the ADEC past what uh, your other recommendations um, um, have. I'm, and I want to clarify that uh, with you folks. I think that you should have language in there to, uh, to essentially lock that in. Uh, my fourth point uh, would be with respect to the, um, uh, the fact that uh, on page 17 of the package, it says preliminary estimates do not factor in the impact of additional employee contributions. And I see that. And then later on increases to the maximum benefit cap of 1% for each year of service work beyond the current maximums. Uh, and it is correct. And it said that it would generate uh, slightly lower savings for both systems. And I would, um, it's, it's hard to gauge that, um, but I think there is enough data and I would recommend taking steps to, um, to get a handle on that cost impact it may be more significant than, uh, than the word slightly. So I think that's something we should take a look at. Or, um, or you should take a look at it. If we can be helpful with our actuaries, we would be happy to do that. Uh, that those are the, the areas that, uh, that uh, um, we've seen in terms of our initial look through this um, as you um, further um, uh, fine tune the proposal or, um, or make revisions, uh, we would be pleased to uh, continue to work with you on that. Again, I want to say thank you. I know this is difficult. Um, uh, none of us want to be in this position, um, but uh, as fiduciaries um, and uh, fiduciaries to the members of the system, uh, we have an obligation to, um, to continue this work. As hard as it is, it will create retirement security again, not for this generation only, but for the next generation, the next generation after that. And uh, uh, we owe it to uh, future uh, generations of retirees to have a system in place that uh, does provide for retirement security. And as hard as these decisions are, um, it, um, it, it is an effort to make sure that we continue to, um, to, to have um, security going forward. And I appreciate the efforts uh, that uh, you folks have made. It's a serious effort. It's a significant effort. It's a difficult process. Um, and it's a difficult decisions that uh, you have going forward, um, but I commend you for doing it. Thank you, Treasurer Pierce. Um, Tanya Vihovsky. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Treasurer Pierce. I am wondering what assets are on hand in the pension fund right now. A little over $5 billion, uh, okay. depending on what the market does in any given day. Yes, I, I recognize it's a moving target. And what is the payout each year that we need to account for? I, and so what I'm kind of getting at is, is this fund in danger of being insolvent in the next year? 
Uh, I do not have the payouts in front of me, but the answer is no. It is not in danger of um, um, being insolvent in the next year. Great, thank you. Rob LeClaire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon there, Madam Treasurer. I, I have a couple of questions. One, can you tell me um, how much a month we're adding to this unfunded liability number? Do, would you have a, a ballpark number at um, status quo? No, you can't, you only, we only do evaluations on an annual basis. So on an annual basis, you can see the gains and losses in terms of its impact on the unfunded liability. Um, but uh, you would not have an interim measurement, for instance, on how mortality uh, was, was um, going from month to month. Um, but uh, we do, as a result of the annual valuation, have an impact year to year. And that's included in, in, in um, my reports uh, on a year to year basis, as well as in the aggregate. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't see a way that we could tell you in the middle of a, you know, in one month, what the mortality um, gains and losses would be, for instance, or the demographic. All right, so I, I guess along with that logic, then I, if, if, forgive me if I got, but did this, this unfunded liability increase by almost like 100, 100 million? Um, our, our ADAC payments gone up 100 million year, yes. year over year, correct? Uh, this year, it's a $96 million increase over the, um, the, the 2022 uh, uh, is a, um, um, an increase of 96 million over the previous year. Okay, and then, so what did the unfunded liability part go up? Okay, well, let me get to one of my charts if you can bear with me for just a minute. So I have the Vistas in front of me. And uh, so in 2000 and, um, um, 2019, the unfunded liability uh, was 55.7. Uh, the unfunded liability in, um, in 2020 is uh, 51.3. It's been on a steady decline. Um, and uh, so if you took a look back pre-recession, it was 80.9, um, dropped rather precipitously with the recession down into the, um, into the 60s and low 60s. And um, um, so that's, that's, forgive me, but that's percent of funded, correct? What, yes. what does that translate into real dollars? Sure. So the unfunded liability in 2011, for instance, was $845 million, and it is now $1.9 billion, $1 billion, $933 million. Okay, so I'm just some big numbers there. So we're, are we like 300 million or more increase in that number from year to year? Um, well, the increase will differ from year to year depending on what. Um, uh, this particular year frame that you're using here, Madam Treasurer. Sure. So let me, again, we're using the teachers. So uh, let me, so in 2000, and, uh, let me just do some numbers here. So in 2013, uh, the unfunded liability was roughly a billion dollars, one billion zero one three. The next year it went up one billion oh seven six. So you see the uh, the difference there. Um, so what are we talking? Um, Sixty some odd million dollars, sixty three million dollars. The next year it went up to one billion one seventy five, then one billion two, then it picked up a pretty big jump from sixteen to seventeen, from one point two to one point five billion. Uh, stayed in that range 1.5 the next year 1.1 billion 513 the year after that 1 billion 554 and now it's um, a jump of um, um, uh, uh, of uh, from 1 billion 5 to 1 billion uh, 933 all right so I mean it sounds like we're conservatively we're looking at at least a hundred million plus a year that this continues to increase correct and just what I'm trying to get at here um, mm -hmm. is for every month that we wait, we're, we're talking, what, eight to $10 million that yeah. hypothetically we could be adding to this number? Well, again, it will, sure, it will vary by year. For instance, when you take a look at 13 to 14, uh, the difference is roughly 63 million that year. 
Um, the next year, you, you're you seeing 175 versus 225. So, you know, you've um, you got a 50 million. Other years, it's more significant. Other years, it's less. So it will vary by year to year. But you are correct. Uh, the longer you delay action, um, um, you increase those unfunded liabilities. Um, if, they, if they do not have a a benefit plan in, in place, um, you, you would be um, increasing those, um, uh, those liabilities on a, on a present basis and then in terms of your future benefits as well, or your future liabilities. Very good. Thank you, Madam Treasurer. John Gannon. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Beth, for testifying this, this afternoon. Um, you probably heard, I think you listened to some of our public testimony on Friday evening and, and yesterday evening. Um, a lot of people calling for us to study this um, for, for a year. Um, what, are, what are your comments with respect to us not doing anything um, in this session and just studying it? And do you think a study, a study would accomplish anything? Well, let me go back a few years. In 2019, we produced the first risk assessment of the, um, of the plan. And uh, that was based on, I'm gonna get in the weeds for a minute, I can't help myself. It was based on actual, uh, actuarial standard of practice uh, 51, ASOP 51, which uh, recommended to uh, retirement boards and plans um, and mandated that the actuaries take a look at risk. We did, did not just a, a preliminary look, we took an extensive look. We, uh, we, we put together a, a package which um, members of this committee as well as members of the Appropriations Committee um, were uh, attended. Um, Representative Gannon, you were a frequent and very uh, committed um, member in attendance of that, and I want to say thank you. And uh, we started looking at the issues, and uh, I believe in November of, um, of that year, we put together a, um, a throw, let's throw out ideas on how we're going to, um, to uh, reduce the liabilities and, and went around the room. And that room, I should go back for a second, had uh, members of the administration, um, uh, trustee board members. So I'm looking and I, I'm seeing that uh, members, uh, the people are testifying today were part of that process. Uh, we had um, uh, my office, we had um, uh, uh, the actuaries, uh, we had a pretty big group. And we, we went, went around the room and what ideas we could have to, um, to um, uh, would be out there to lower the, li the, the liabilities and put it on a better um, track. That was 2019. And the result of that um, uh, was that, well, we need to take more time. Uh, now I will point out that COVID also was there, and, uh, but uh, we, um, we didn't get there. And, um, and delaying from that, we're now in a more precarious situation. And I would suggest the time for delay is over and that we need to get this done. Uh, I remember having frequent conversations with uh, then speaker uh, Johnson and, and the members of the, um, of the um, employee groups as well as members of, um, of the various committees about the need to get this done and trying to move that before that session ended. And we were not successful. I think that the longer you put this off, the, um, uh, the more critical the situation gets, number one, and um, and you, um, if you don't have the will to do it back in 19, you don't have the will to do it in uh, in 21, I don't know where you think you're gonna get the will to do it in 22 and 23. Thank you, and, and uh, sort of a follow-up question to that. Um, you know, our funded ratios stand at, um, 66.4% for VSERVs and 51.3 for VSERVs. Um, is there a point where those funding ratios, if they continue to decline, becomes very problematic? Yeah, and I think we're pretty close to that. Um, um, you know, plans that get very low in terms of their um, of their um, uh, funding percentage have more pressures in terms of uh, the ADEC and the ability to to pay that off off over a period of time. Um, uh, I think Chris uh, um, might have done a similar um, uh, analysis that I did. I took the normal cost and assumed it would increase by three and a half percent for one system and three percent for the other, and uh, and just took the existing amortization schedule and put that together. So that means if there are no other um, uh, uh, losses or gains outside of what we've already had, mostly losses, and that um, payroll stays at the same rate that it that it was scheduled to do, um, uh, and you probably have more 
um, more risk to that than uh, than um, that, um, you know of it being a higher number as opposed to to lowering the liabilities. And I and I tracked it out for both systems out to 2037. Uh, the ADEC, the combined ADEC for both systems will be a half billion dollars. And it could be worse. Um, and uh, half billion dollars is a lot of money. And, you know, I'm taking a look at other needs that the state has as well. And beyond just the other needs, because I think that that's, that argument um, has been used not to fund the ADEC in the past, it's not a, a path that is sustainable for our members. And it puts them in a more precarious state going forward, whether we come up with more draconian um, uh, uh, recommendations or, um, and frankly, moving to a different system like a DC system, defined contribution, which I think would be extraordinarily, extraordinarily um, uh, injurious to the members and it would not save the state any money. But I see that as uh, folks um, taking a look at t other types of models that would actually cause more harm to the, um, to the um, uh, to the members of the system and more harm to the state and the taxpayers. So I think that um, you, you look at this, it's time to act, it's time to put together a, uh, a plan that essentially is protecting people in the long run. Thank you. And thank you for all your hard work uh, on this. And I, I mean, these are very difficult decisions to make and your leadership has been incredible. Well. If I could just follow up on that, uh, Representative Gannon, all of you are in that same spot right now. You're working through some very difficult decisions. Um, it's painful. Uh, you know, it's kept me up at night. I'm sure it's kept all of you up at night and uh, wish we could be doing something else um, uh, at this point in time. Um, I um, commend you for staying with it. This is, um, uh, this is difficult and uh, certainly we'd all rather be doing something else, but we're doing our jobs by, uh, by, by, um, continuing the course here. Tanya Vihovsky. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Treasurer Pierce. Um, so I, I hear, and, and certainly help me to just understand this, but I hear sort of conflicting, we're not in danger of becoming insolvent, but it is a crisis. And then I question how we got here. And if it's not an immediate crisis, meaning that we won't be insolvent in the next year, isn't it our job to do our due diligence to build a plan going forward that is truly sustainable and that we truly understand all of the ways that we got here. So for me, and, and again, correct me if I'm, I'm missing something, it feels really important to take the time to make sure we do this right. Well, I would say that we have taken the time and let me go back, 2019, we started this process um, uh, of taking a look through a risk assessment. We've issued a report, you folks have responded to that, you've created some recommendations. Uh, and again, I do not see um, if, 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 if we lack the will to get it done now, we lack the will to get it done earlier, then, um, then why we would expect that we could um, um, uh, change that course down the road. I think that the information is there, the actuaries have vetted it. I think that um, you are in a position to act and I would urge you to act. You know, having money today, this is a little like, uh, go taking a look at your home finances. Um, I've got, um, I've got uh, um, uh, $10,000 extra in the bank. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, um, not worry about the fact that I've got all these other bills down the road uh, that I have to pay. Um, and I might use it for something else, okay? And you might use it for other types of appropriations. You might, you, you, your balance sheet's gonna look okay. Uh, well, actually not your balance sheet if you, if you uh, accrue those uh, liabilities, uh, which you should. But you might be looking and saying, I, I, can, I can wait and put this off. Um, and uh, you put yourself and your home budget into into much more precarious situation. Um, we shouldn't be doing that here. We should be dealing with the fact that we have a problem. We need to address it. We've got the inputs. You've seen uh, we did forty some odd different scenarios for each system uh, with the actuaries, testing out different um, variables and different types of impacts and and produce the results. Your efforts have done similar things. You've done a number of um, of scenario building with the actuaries. We went and did a comprehensive risk assessment starting in 2019. I would suggest that the path to do this is there. Um, and again, just because you can pay your bill this month doesn't mean that you, um, uh, you should ignore the warning signs and not take care of business now. Mike McCarthy. Um, thanks, Madam Treasurer, for being with us. And um, I, I share some of the, the 
sentiments that Representative Gannon expressed, uh, I know how hard it is to bring up some of these really painful ideas about how to solve this problem when I've seen you really care and stick up for workers the entire time you've been involved in Vermont politics. And I really thank you and appreciate your expertise and service. Um, the questions I have are, are about governance in relation to some of the things that we heard during the public hearing. We heard again and again, comments to the effect that, you know, the state has mismanaged pension funds, you know, that, that we've spent money irresponsibly, it hasn't earned enough, et cetera. And I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about who is ultimately responsible for making the decisions about how uh, pension fund assets are invested under the current right. governance model. Right. Well, I know we're going to get into governance more um, tomorrow. Um, I'll look to the, um, uh, to the chair to let me know if I'm going off uh, subject here. So um, there is a, um, a, a Vermont Pension Investment Committee. Um, it has a member from each of the, uh, that's appointed by each of the, um, of the um, um, boards of trustees. And then it has myself and it has a, um, uh, two members appointed by the governor. And then they elect a chair. And that chair is a um, uh, investment uh, expert. Um, and uh, so it's a group of six plus a seventh that's elected um, by the group. Um, uh, and, uh, he or she, in this case, he obviously, Tom, uh, has a, um, uh, a small salary compared to what he, uh, uh, the time that he puts into it's equivalent of um, one third of what uh, the treasurer receives. And that committee makes the decisions. It has an, it has a investment fiduciary, um, a uh, investment consultant, an independent consultant, not a manager, an individual, uh, independent consultant uh, that works as a fiduciary to the, um, to the committee to assist in looking at issues of asset allocation, which is where you really, uh, your strategic issues, uh, all the way through to, uh, to uh, manager selection. So this is a group of seven. I am a member of it. I have one vote. Um, my staff does surprise, su uh, provide support to it, uh, including the uh, chief investment officer. Uh, and we've been very, very fortunate with our last two to have some very good uh, people in that position. Um, um, and uh, Matt Considine and um, Eric Henry. And uh, so that's the governance model that we have. I would say that um, Coming out of the Great Recession, uh, we, um, we, we did pretty well those first few years out of that. We, our position in our portfolio for the most, uh, for many of the years, hit its actual rate of return. I think that that's um, uh, a misconception. However, when it missed, 15 and 16 in particular, they were pretty significant misses. Uh, 15 was the, um, the China meltdown, um, the, uh, the impact in the, um, in the month of June on the uh, Shanghai um, uh, stock exchange. And that, that really had an impact across all markets, uh, not just um, um, uh, uh, obviously Vermont. And then 16 was the um, uh, Brexit, which happened I think the last week of June, which um, again had, a, had an impact on our, our end of uh, um, end of year numbers. Uh, for, uh, 13, while we were over the, um, the, the assumed rate of return, um, the month of May, we were looking, I mean, April, we were looking very, very good. Uh, we ended up, I think, someplace around eight. I'm doing this off the top of my head. So um, if, um, if Will has, um, Will, Will Crewald from my staff is on, if you've got a... Uh, well, uh, I guess what I would say, Treasurer Pierce, is that I'm less concerned with the specifics and more about how it, how it works so that we can, we can, it can sure. uh, help guide our decision making. And, and yep. so I think there was an impression among many of the people we've heard from that they don't have representation, that they don't have a say. And I guess my question would be, you know, how could employees, whether they're, they're in the state system or educators in the teacher system, how, how can they make an impact on how investment decisions are made under the current model and who speaks for them? Okay. Well, the trustee boards um, have uh, un um, uh, employee representation uh, and they, um, are, uh, they appoint members to the VPIC. So all three boards have um, a member on the VPIC. Uh, as I said, the, um, um, the governor has two, uh, then myself, and then we pick a chair. So they do have representation. The meetings are public. Uh, certainly, we'd um, be happy to, um, to receive any uh, information that folks want to provide us, uh, and they're, they're encouraged to come to, to, our, to our meetings. Uh, we, um, uh, but ultimately, the, uh, the VPIC makes those decisions with the, the idea of maximizing risk, 
I mean, excuse me, <laughs> my apologies, <laughs> Ma maximizing return with acceptable levels of risk. And that's done through an asset allocation process and, with, and an asset liability process. So I think that uh, um, it's professionally managed, but it has input um, from the, uh, from the uh, trustee boards uh, via their representatives. So Treasurer Pierce, my last question is when each year, whether, whether or not the rate of return or the experience is what VPIC and the boards agreed it would be, um, the contributions of employees into the system aren't changed through that process. You know, the, the VPIC doesn't control that. Right. Um, and that the only input the legislature really has at that point is to approve the ADAC amount, that, that bill that we get for covering the costs plus what we need in order to cover future liabilities, right? We, we don't really have input into that process or the management of the funds or the management of the plans uh, here in the legislature other than approving the funding for the, the bill that we get. Well, I, I don't think that's entirely, I, um... All, all of all of what the legislature has in, in terms of its decision making. Uh, number one, you make the decisions on the um, on the um, uh, contributions, the benefit, um, the benefits, and the amount of um, of um, uh, contributions for state employees. Uh, so uh, you you have the option um, at any point in time to uh, to change those. You could change the uh, the benefits as you're taking a look now, and you're taking a look at the uh, at the contribution rates. Those are within the purview of um, of the General Assembly and not uh, uh, not the Treasurer's Office. That said, we make recommendations, but again, you have that uh, that that ability. Every year, for instance, in the municipal system, um, we've gone through a process of looking at employer and employee contribution rates. The employers are set by the um, uh, um, by, by the board because they, the board represents the various municipal empl employers that, um, that aren't funded by the state. Um, but they also have a, a process where they look at that in relationship to the employee rates. And um, it's kind of a, it's a little bit of a risk model, uh, risk sharing model to be very frank. And we come back to you and, um, and give you some recommendations. So we, a few years back, we did a four year, it's gonna increase by an eighth, an eighth, a fourth, and a fourth, you know, the, um, the percentage for both the employer and the employee. Um, and uh, you have the option of acting on that, and, and you have. So I think that that's within the uh, purview of the, um, the General Assembly. In addition to that, the various actions that take place that have an impact on the unfunded liability. Um, as I mentioned in previous testimony, uh, decisions around personnel and, and levels of personnel, um, the state salary um, uh, levels and the number of positions, um, we, uh, the retirement incentives that have happened in past. Um, uh, changes, uh, for instance, in the, um, um, uh, in, in the demographics of the teacher system and as they relate to reorganization or um, um, uh, efforts, and we've seen a rise in teacher turnover, uh, we've seen a rise in teacher retirements, and uh, you know, what are the underlying pieces and are they related to policy uh, that, uh, that uh, the General Assembly can take a look at. So I don't think it's just, we hand you a bill and that's the end of it. Um, it's clearly a dialogue on a number of issues, a number of policy issues, and those are within the purview of the, uh, the General Assembly. Thanks very much. I guess the last thing I, I would say is, short of cutting staff or making painful asks of them to contribute more or change their benefit structure, the, the legislature really just has to put in the additional funds. And this year in that scenario, if we don't make any of those changes that you talked about being in our purview, uh, if I understand the numbers right, you know, in the teacher system, for instance, they're putting in somewhere in the ballpark of just under $40 million. And so what the state employer contributions add up to is just under $200 million. Is that about right? Uh, I'd have to look at the financials to do that. Uh, clearly the, uh, the, the larger is the employer share by the state uh, for both the systems. I think that you might be picking up just one of the systems in terms of the total employee contributions. I'd, I'd um, have to pull that up um, and um, uh, uh, take a look at the financial statement to do that. And I don't have it right in front of me. Um, I do have a couple of staff folks on the call. If they want to take a look at that and uh, chime in later, I guess we can get that information for you. 
Okay, thanks very much. So Beth, I have it. It's $41 million of employee contributions last year for the teacher system alone. Okay, in the state system? I don't have that. The example okay. was the teachers. Okay. So getting to your point, um, uh, Representative McCarthy, the 40 was just one system, um, but, uh, but yes. Thank you. Um, Mark Higley. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Treasurer. Um, so I'm one of the ones that's kind of been pushing for at least looking at or considering a a hybrid plan, whether it's a DC plan or I've heard about a cash balance plan. Um, I know in talking with some of the folks out there, there are other states that are going down this road. So when you said that, uh, that this DC plan or a DC plan could be injurious to the members of the system, sure. my understanding from the folks that I talked to is uh, initially that defined benefit system would not be touched. So those, those folks, those employees would, would not have any uh, injury to, to that system. And then, um, you know, the three initial um, uh, concerns or, or that should be addressed is, number one, pay down the debt as fast as you can. Number two, get your assumptions right. And number three, build a plan for the future. And that means something that's sustainable for the state and for the employees. And I guess, again, I just have to ask, it's happening in other states. So why, why can't we look at that here? I don't understand the injurious going forward to current uh, pension holders. Well, I would suggest that what's happened in other states has not uh, necessarily been the right action in, in a number of those states. When I've taken a look, for instance, at... Um, uh, one of the more recent states. I'm try. I try not to go out there and throw names out there, states, and um, and um, and uh, throw throw darts at them. But um, uh, it actually had a significant decline in the um, doing the hybrid plan. Had a significant decline in benefits. It just wasn't as as straightforward. So let me go back to the premise that that I had on a DC plan and start from there. Um, the DC plan, a defined contribution plan, um, is it. Uh, that you you and you put in your money, the employer, the state puts in its money, and then you get to invest those dollars, and you get to invest those in a uh, menu of different options that are provided um, uh, through. Um, um, uh, in this case, in the state plan, um, uh, I'm the trustee of the DC plan. In the teachers, in the municipal system, the um, uh, the uh, uh, board is, uh, the board of trustees and the teacher system does not have a, um, uh, a DC plan. And the DC plan in the state system is only for exempt employees. It is a, a small, um, small DC plan. So a couple of considerations on that. Number one, um, when you do that, you, there's a good chance that uh, when you do that, you can run out of dollars um, down the road because you, you're making investment decisions for yourself. You're putting that money in. The rates are higher. The fees are higher because you don't have the economies of scale uh, that you would if you were pooling those investments. Um, so, so you probably have a, a, a higher cost in terms of um, um, the, the uh, to invest the expenses. In addition to that, um, uh, most folks that are in a DC plan are not, um, not CIOs. Uh, they're engineers, they're, uh, they, they might be social workers, whatever it might be, really important jobs, I might add. Um, and they're not going to be the, the, um, uh, the best in terms of optimizing their investments. Um, so you're going to have higher fees and likely lower returns. Um, so that's, that's not a good equation to begin with. Um, there's also, um, so, uh, we've done some st looking at depletion, um, that uh, people that are in the DC plan and how long is it before they're going to run out of dollars. And, um, and frankly, a lot of folks are going to run out way before they're, 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 they're likely. No one knows when, the, when that um, passing event is going to happen. But in terms of longevity and mortality, a lot of folks are going to run out of money and not have adequate savings in retirement. So when they do not have adequate savings in retirement, what happens? They have to rely on, on, on other sources of assistance, uh, food assistance, uh, heating assistance. And those dollars cost the state and the federal government dollars now. In a pension system, a defined benefit plan, and we'll go back uh, in, a, in a bit, uh, uh, roughly 60, 62 percent of every dollar that's paid to an individual is out of um, investment income. OK, um, uh, every dollar that you pay to somebody, 62 cents is coming from the investment earnings. If someone runs out of money, 
um, and, you know, and does not have adequate money in retirement, and they have to rely on different assistance payments. Those are one for one dollars. So what's happening there is that uh, instead of paying for something with 62 cents on, on the dollar to investment income, you're paying it with straight appropriation dollars. So it's more cost costly for a state government um, uh, to, um, to, to provide those services and uh, if retirement security is not there. In addition to that, um, when you're looking at it, um, uh, right now, I'm, I'm looking around at one of the members here. So Mike, Mike uh, McCarthy, Representative McCarthy, he's a little younger than me, um, a lot younger than me actually, okay? And if he was in the retirement system, he might be able to take a little more risk because he's got more years to, uh, to um, um, to, to make up for any, any potential losses. So he might take a little more risk than I am at 67, um, closer to retirement, and as I always say, but not going there yet, folks, um, and uh, um, that I might take less risk, okay, because um, I don't have as many years to make up if you have a market disruption. In a, uh, in a pooled defined benefit plan, you put those together so you have risk pooling so that you can put a, a little further out in the curve and benefit everybody in the process. So those are the basics of why retirement security is, uh, is it's a better option with a DB plan. DB plan, you've got a guaranteed payment through the, through, through the, um, uh, through, through the end of your life. Um, and uh, it, um, it, it provides more retirement security. It's at lower fees. It's a greater efficiency, so better bang for your buck. And here's the piece on appropriations. If you were to do a DC plan, the DC plan would replace what's called the normal cost, not the unfunded liability. So the normal cost is the amount of money that you put aside every year so that when, um, when I retire, Mike, I keep putting you back in the system, excuse me, representative, if he was in the system, what it would, uh, when, uh, when he, the probabilities that when he would retire, what his salary might be, and then um, you calculate how much you need to put aside as a percentage of payroll each year so that when, when you get to, to his or my retirement, you have enough money set aside. That normal retirement number is um, um, uh, a percentage of payroll. Now, right now in the state system, the normal, um, the normal, uh, the, the DC uh, plan has seven percent of payroll. So the employee, the employee puts in money, the employer puts in seven percent of payroll. The normal cost for both systems, the state system and the teacher system, is south of seven percent. So if you're going to replace something that only impacts the normal cost and not the unfunded liability. Let's say this, uh, one of these are around four and one's at five, I believe. Um, I, um, uh, I'll let Will um, jump out with the, uh, with the normal cost percentages are later if you want that, but they're south of 7%. So my question to you is, what's one's gonna cost more? The one where you pay less than seven or the one that you pay more than, uh, you pay seven? Well, the answer is obviously the one you pay less in terms of your normal cost. So it is going to cost you more money to have a DC plan. Now, the next step uh, in this process is that, um, so that's short term, okay? The next step is that um, uh, you, uh, you take a look and you say the long term. The unfunded liability is not replaced by a DC plan. Um, the, uh, the unfunded liability uh, for, uh, for instance, in Pennsylvania, I'm just going to not mention states, um, uh, the unfunded liability does not go away. Uh, the unfunded liability would still be $1.9 billion for the, uh, uh, for the teacher system and a billion for the state system here. Uh, you've now added cost on the, um, on, the, uh, on the budgetary pressures by doing a DC plan. And that doesn't matter, um, but you, you're, not, um, you're not impacting the, uh, the unfunded liability still exist. And what we've seen in states such as West Virginia, uh, which had a DB, DB plan, defined benefit plan, switch to a DC plan, then said it's costing us too much and we can't get the recruitment of people we need. So we're gonna go back to a DB plan. Is that it did not diminish the unfunded liability. In fact, it increased. And the reason it increased is that because it was closed, if you close a system to new members, so when, um, if you were to close it and say, we're gonna keep the old system where we are, but we're not gonna put in new members, for instance, you're gonna have um, um, the, the people in that system age over time. You're not gonna have new members, younger members. And as that happens and more people reach retirement age, uh, you're going to have to have more liquid assets. And when you have more liquid assets, you, have, you end up usually uh, with a situation where you make less money um, on, on those, uh, those assets. So. Um, I would contend uh, and see evidence to, um, to, the, um, uh, to that uh, point that the cost, 
the unfunded liability doesn't go away. And in fact, it um, has significant potential to increase. So less retirement security, cost you more in the short term, unfunded liability doesn't go away and it will likely cost you more in the long term. I don't think that's a very good equation. Thank you, Beth. Uh, Peter Anthony. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. <clears throat> there are several things I pretty sure I know, um, but one of them is not whether we have to do everything. By the way, when I say everything, I mean uh, tend to every change that's on the table today. I completely agree with my uh, colleague about uh, John Gannon about transparency. Want to know where all the fees are? There can't be any proprietary charges that are not known. I think that's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. um, add to which, in the investment category, I uh, completely agree with Mr. Galanka. If you can't explain what the asset is and how it performs, what it does, and who's backing it, don't buy it. Yeah. Where I get hazy and where I am not willing to say it's all or nothing is when I try to explain or answer questions about the effect of, for instance, a standard age retirement across different groups. And I'm asked, well, what will that have to do? How will that affect either retention or uh, the ability to hire new candidates? And when I don't have an answer to that, I say, well, okay, there's a question that I'm unwilling to go with a conclusion which does not address the possibility that we may be making it more difficult to govern and to serve Vermonters, uh, that one ought to be stated aside. I completely agree with Treasurer Pierce about pre-funding. I know this is an opportunity to use federal dollars, which if we don't, we will be in future using general fund dollars. So my answer is yes, let's do ADAC, plus as much as the Appropriations Committee is willing to advance us, and as much as management and budget is able to substitute general fund for federal, let's, as Treasurer Pierce has suggested, make some early ballooned payments on the pre-funding of the health care benefits so that we get on a glide path earlier. And let's, in fact, write whatever we do, uh, a sunset provision so that it, at least in 2038, we literally uh, take a step back and refigure this. But my point is, there's, these are big buckets, uh, whether you divide them by governance, benefits, uh, and how you slice and dice benefits, there are certain obvious things that commit dollars we can do now. I have no problem with that. Um, but there's some things that I um, call surgical um, actions for which I have no answer. And I'm very, very reluctant to put my name next to something where I, I do not have faith in my own understanding of the effects of that. Thank you. Hal Colston. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and thank you, um, uh, Madam Treasurer. Uh, what have you and your team learned in the past recent years to improve our pension system so it's sustainable and predictable? Well, I think that um, one of the things that we, we have talked about is um, increasing the uh, frequency in which we do um, uh, uh, experience studies. And I think that that's helpful. I think that um, we've done a, a very good job of taking apart the, um, the, um, the, the inputs in terms of um, uh, gains and losses. And uh, back um, several years ago, we um, asked the prior actuary to, to kind of format that a little differently so that we could see that. Um, and uh, so I think we've got a better, good handle on um, what, what the levers are in terms of what's impacting um, the, the unfunded liability. And you see some numbers in, uh, in my report and you see some that Chris has done as well um, for JFO. Um, so I think we have a better understanding of that over time. And I think that um, um, that needs to, to translate into actions. Uh, and again, uh, going back to 2009 and 10, when the retirement incentive was done, 
we, we pointed out the downsides of that in terms of its impact on gains and losses. And, um, and unfortunately, the, um, um, those did happen. And uh, we, um, we um, uh, ended up having um, uh, more losses than we anticipated by not keeping to the plan. Um, but we were able to, able to point that out. I think that we're, we have some, some uh, enhanced ability there. We've got a great, we've got a great actuary uh, and they do good work. You know, when I keep hearing that the actuary was wrong, the actuary takes the best data that's available um, to take a look at something and, and projects, you know, the, um, uh, any actuary in 2007 uh, would have, um, uh, or 2006 would probably not have predicted the great, great recession. You know, we have what's called um, 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 black swan events, unpredictable events. And uh, it's a great deal of publication on that in the investment world. I think John just smiled as I said that. But um, um, the, um, um, you're not going to you're not going to be able to say an actuary is going to be 100% right, and I think that we need to understand the reasons why. But there are unforeseen events uh, that impact this. Uh, but I think that we've done a, a much better job of disaggregating what's in that unfunded liability, disaggregating what um, uh, uh, what the gains and losses are, and making the case for full funding. Um, you know, we were pushing this, uh, the issue of full funding the, the pension system, particularly the teacher system that was severely underfunded uh, from 1990 to 2007. And by making that case, we were able to, uh, to, to see some change. And that was uh, my predecessor. I was a deputy at the time, uh, Treasurer Spalding. And in 2014, uh, and I think you made those effective in 15, uh, the underfunding of the um, of the uh, the healthcare as a subfund of the teachers' pension, and we made those changes. So by d diving into this, we're able to do more analytics and being able to assist you. And I think we've done that in this case. If you go to the appendices of our report and uh, you take a look, there's an awful lot of different scenarios. What if this is done? What if you change this contribution? What if you change the um, uh, if you change the uh, uh, the age of retirement, what if you change the, um, the, the the formula for AFC? And there are scenario after scenario after scenario. And since we've done the report, there are more scenarios, and uh, and you've done some of the same work as 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 a legislative body. So I think we're able to dive in and take a look at those and to make good estimates with the data we have. You're never going to have a perfect world on this. I mean, if uh, if everybody could predict the future, we'd all be um, billionaires. Uh, I'm going to skip past millionaire and go to billionaire. Um, we're not. Uh, none of us are going to be able to predict the future. You are going to have uh, unpredictable events. But I think that uh, we've been able to, to disaggregate and get a better feeling for the analytics. The risk assessment process we did in 2019 helped us with that. And we're going to continue to do that and continue to look at the risk assessment process. I don't know if I'm answer the question or if I've gone around it and I apologize. Thank you very much. Okay. Sam Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I have a couple of questions and thank you, um, Beth, for being here. So I asked earlier when this all came about, how much does it cost administratively to run our DB plan? And I don't expect that answer off the top of anyone's head, but if that could be sent to me in an email, sure. I'd greatly appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, because I keep hearing how costly it is to run a DC plan. Um, and in my best knowledge of that is whatever company that we would decide to use, they do that work, you know? So administrative cost on our side is, is cut away. Um, and, you know, I do understand that um, it, it's okay to look into different things. And if we are going to be transparent and working through this, um, because right now, my understanding is people that enjoy defined benefit plans, they like the low to no risk and the defined income. That's not what's happening right now. Um, and definitely with the proposal would not be happening because the, the, people in the plan are taking on a lot of risk. Every time there's a mess up on our end, we are asking for more money and that's what's gonna to continue to happen. And it's it's not okay to be saying that we're in a divine benefit because we're people are gonna be continually asked to put up more. Um, and they should be the ultimate stakeholder in their own. And it's 
you know, there are options inside a divine contribution plan. And I'm more than happy to talk about this at another time where people, if they, you know, yeah, the social workers, the police officers, um, the IT people, if they don't feel comfortable, there are other safe harbor options they can use or they just go on cruise control um, and, and their money's working for them. And there are no other um, committees that are mismanaging the funds or actuaries that are not working with the correct data. Um, because I do understand that actuaries do a very good job um, working with the data they have. And sometimes that data is not correct. Um, so I feel it's time that we, we truly look at this and maybe some over clouding gets removed a little bit um, over DC plans or a hybrid, um, because I, I do feel that could be a benefit going forward. And I know I'm not the only one. Well, I'm going to take exception with two, uh, two statements. Uh, mismanage the funds is completely inaccurate, and I'd uh, be happy to have that conversation. Uh, you know, we've, uh, uh, I think that VPIC has moved in a, in a very good direction. I appreciate the work that folks have done. You know, are you going to hit, um, you know, the top peer group at any point in time? You, you got a market cycle and an asset allocation. Um, I think that um, to suggest that it's mismanaged, I think, is, 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 is not accurate. Actuaries, you know, did not get it wrong. The actuaries did the, what they had at the time, and we've made changes. We've made decisions in, in, um, um, that um, have impacted that. And then, as I said, we had those unpredictable events. Um, the, uh, uh, for instance, uh, 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 in the investment side, as I said, Brexit. I don't think that I didn't have a vote in uh, England on what was going to happen there. Um, but um, so. I, I would say that uh, as we're looking to say, you know, what happened, let's not spend time blaming. Let's find a way to move forward and say work together. Now, getting back to the DC plan and the expenses, uh, those expenses are embedded in the rate uh, in in the um, in the um, uh, the fees that are paid by individuals, whether it's the overall management fee or whether it's the uh, the, the fees for the various investment vehicles. Um, evidence uh, that I've seen, and I know folks are going to disagree with this, are, um, are that uh, those fees are more expensive. I would uh, send you to take a look at a report that was done. It's on the National Institute of Retirement Security called Better Bang for the Buck. And uh, it was done by a uh, actuary firm originally, and it's been updated. And it shows um, um, the various factors and why a DC plan uh, versus a DB plan is that you get a better bang for your buck with, uh, with a DB plan. Uh, comparing it to the private sector, by the way, is, is, is uh, and just in case we're going down that route, it's a very different environment, and I'd be happy to have a longer conversation about that down the road. But I do think that when you talk about retirement security, we're making benefit, suggesting, uh, recommending benefit changes right now. But a person will have a retirement as opposed to a situation in a DC plan where they may run out of money before their lifespan is, um, has, has ended and put people in poverty at the end of their life. And I think that that to me is the worst thing that we can do um, as a state um, um, in terms of our, um, the, 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 the folks in our, in our state their, um, and our responsibility to them. So folks, we've got two hands raised at the moment and we've got a few more people in our meeting here who I would like to give time to react to the uh, plan design proposals that we put on the table last week. Um, and you know, I know that we've meandered a bit around through some different issues here, um, but I think this has all been a really valuable um, conversation. And so I'm um, gonna go ahead and let us let us meander, just want to rein us in after these last two questions so that we can hear from the folks from the uh, retirement system boards uh, and anyone else who might want to weigh in on uh, reactions to the uh, benefit design changes that we proposed. So Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Treasurer. I think we just got the edict that we're on the lightning round with Alex Trebek now. Um, the last time we did an early retirement initiative, uh, I don't think we did enough digging into what it was going to have as an impact on the workforce and the basically the entire AOT engineering division took a walk out the door. Mm -hmm. Have we done any kind of look into what impact this particular plan will have on the workforce as a whole? Well, I would say a couple of things on that. The actuaries cannot make a determination that we can't determine what be, people's behaviors are going to be in terms of this, and the actuaries can't make that uh, that um, um, uh, 
estimate, and neither can we in many cases. Well, let me go back to the retirement incentive that you just mentioned, uh, Representative Hooper. Uh, uh, keep in mind, we're on the lightning round here. Okay, I'll try to do it fast. So when we did the first retirement incentive, uh, we sent out a notice to about 1,100 people uh, that were um, uh, potentially eligible for the retirement incentive, said we were going to do 300, you know, in total, but um, 1,100 people. A lot of them called our office. A lot of them got estimates. A lot of them checked out, you know, if they did a purchase service, you know, and things, what it would look like. They, they did all that work. Um, ultimately, uh, we had um, um, over 300, because we had 300 positions that, uh, uh, or slots for this, uh, we had over 300 um, that, that applied. Um, so we ended up having to do with a, a lottery. We literally put everybody's, you know, just like uh, name a uh, 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 number on um, on a ping pong ball, put them in the thing, rolled them out, and came up with, you know, the first, the 300 that would be in the lottery if we exceeded that number. In fact, a lot of people pulled their paperwork. So even though they expressed that they wanted to leave, and they were going to take this, they turned around and then they pulled their paperwork. So then we got under 300. And then as we were doing this and people were retiring um, or about to make the decision, they pulled the paperwork again. So we ended up with someplace in the, a little north of 200. So we started with a thousand, you know, and, and what the estimate could be. We ended up with something north of, uh, something in the 400 range, then 300, and then we ended up with 200 something. Um, so it's very difficult to predict what people's actions are gonna be. That was one example. As of today, we've had 81, um, I'm just taking a look over at my notes here. 81 um, uh, retirements that uh, um, uh, that have been put into the system. Um, we, um, you know, in a given year, as you know, we do a um, sizable amount in, the, in, in, in June, something north of, um, uh, something in the area of 500. I'm just trying to see if I can find my note on that. And we have had an up, an increase, significant increase in the number of folks that have put an inquiry into purchase a service. That doesn't mean the purchase of time. That doesn't mean they're going to do it, but we have had a significant increase in that. Um, just like in the retirement incentive, people check out their options and then they make decisions. And what we're being very careful to say is don't make a decision till you know all the facts. Don't make a decision until we know what the, uh, what the options that uh, are going to be uh, presented by the General Assembly and what will ultimately be adopted. And I think we've all been saying that. That was clearly a bad question for the lightning round. I'll try this one. Uh, we have a plan in place for a 2038 removal of the unfunded liability. Beyond mm -hmm. the idea that our assumption changes this year increase that, should we be throwing the 2038 plan away or can we add to the amount that this new adjustment in assumptions created and still meet our goal or should we add five years to it? So I think you're saying is extend out the uh, the unfund uh, the amortization schedule past 2038, or hit it or hit it with cash like we're considering doing. Okay. I think that um, um, uh, cash is always a, a good thing for a system having paying down the principal essentially or putting those cash in and let it invest. But again, you have to have a plan that ke keeps the discipline. We did the 26.2 million dollars in 2000 and. 18 for the um, for the 2020 um, uh, ADEC, and then the next year that um, that went away. So I think there has to be some discipline to that. Putting re pushing up the amortization will not change the unfunded liability. It will add additional interest payments um, for the uh, for the for the uh, system. And I think that uh, ultimately it costs more when we moved up the the, um, the schedule. So you had to pay more upfront instead of a backloaded amortization schedule in 2016. Uh, we saved the taxpayers about $165 million. Um, so I would suggest that doing that, um, it just kind of kicks the can down the road and it costs money to do it. Okay, last question. There seems to be a conflation of the unfunded liability and the normal cost in a lot of this discussion mm -hmm. in a lot of people's mind. Yep. I think uh, education on that uh, probably is in order because it's confusing as hell. Okay, so the that's, that's, is, a, that's a suggestion. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you wanted me to do education now. I won't. Uh, I'm looking at the chair and she's saying, no, 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 don't, don't that's go there. Definitely not lightning round territory. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank yeah, you. not not lightning round territory, but I would um, uh, direct folks who are following along on the on YouTube that there are a lot of resources on our committee page. Um, some of them have been moved um, to the front of the committee page on the left side underneath the list of committee members names. And so if anyone's looking to 
uh, avail themselves of some of that sort of pensions 101, um, you should be able to find some more resources there. Um, so I'm gonna go to Tanya Vihovsky and then we need to get to a few other witnesses. So go ahead, Tanya. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I have two questions. One's actually a question that I was asked by a constituent. Did healthcare costs ever come out of the investment earnings for the pension plan? Healthcare costs came out of the, um, the teacher's plan, um, not the state. Uh, so in the teacher's plan um, up to 2004, 15. I think we passed the legislation. I might be a year off. I think we passed the legislation. You passed the legislation in 14, effective for 15. So what was happening prior to that is that um, um, health care benefits were paid as a subtrust of the um, of the pension fund, um, and uh, and uh, uh, which was okay. But what was happening is that, for instance, in 2012, when we when I did a presentation on this. Um, the the health care costs were roughly um, twenty four million dollars in premium payments, um, and uh, four million was appropriated by the uh, by the general assembly. So the remaining twenty million was essentially a an actuarial loss to the system. And then the next year you had another actuarial loss. And then the next year after that you had another actuarial loss. That twenty million dollars in two thousand and twelve going out to two thousand thirty eight was going to cost the taxpayers uh, sixty million dollars. It was fifty eight million actually. Then you do it again, then you do it again. So that's why we had to make that change. But yes, uh, and it did have an impact. Yes, it was an actuarial loss to the system. Um, yes, we, uh, the 2009 um, commissions uh, recommended changing that. It, uh, um, we recommended it and it finally did occur in 2014. Great, thank you. So my other question, um, and you may not have the answer, but you did talk a lot about how much more expensive it is for people to access state benefits that don't have this. And you know, I think you mentioned 62 cents on the dollar investment return. Mm -hmm. Do we have an understanding of how many this people, this plan could push into poverty, thus forcing them to access state benefits? Or if there are people that it would push into that position, have we done any exploration there about what impact this would have in that area? We've done some sample um, impacts, which we're going to re, uh, to um, to present to the retirement board. We've taken different um, different types of um, uh, employees, real employees in most cases. So you know, somebody's been there forty years. They have X, um, their age X. You know, what is it going to do in terms of their benefit? Uh, what is it going to do in uh, our proposals? What is it going to do in terms of um, um, uh, the retirement benefit that you're going to have now? the impact in terms of uh, what it would do in terms of the cost of living changes and what it would do in terms of contributions. And finally, how do those contributions turn into um, uh, in terms of actual take out of your pay because pensions are on pre-tax basis. So let's say it's $1,200 of increased in, in a given year of increased contribution. How much of it is actually gonna be in your paycheck since, um, since uh, you're not paying uh, uh, it's pre-tax and it's not a subject to FICA and um, and uh, federal tax. I don't think we're putting the state tax in because uh, um, it's not as significant, but we have we are in the process of finishing that and we'll be presenting that to the trustee boards. When is that presentation? Um, I think the first one will be, I think the boards, uh, the teacher's board, um, Erica is on, do you, can you, I know the teacher's board was still on schedule, the state one, the state board, we're having to reschedule because it's the same day that we're doing, and this is significant for you folks, the same day we're doing the, um, um, the bond rating presentations to, the, um, uh, to a couple of the Wall Street firms. So uh, something, again, that you should consider as we're looking at this. But Eric, I believe that the teachers is around the 8th or something of um, April? That's correct. Okay. And we expect to have the state one done, uh, sent out shortly thereafter. And we will provide copies of this to, uh, to, uh, to your office. And those were on your proposals, not the yes. current proposal that we're discussing. That's correct. So that evaluation hasn't been done for this, this proposal. Well, you can, they certainly can be done and some of them are very similar, um, you know, and um, you know, you can employ the actuary to do that if you, if you like, but uh, ours will give you a pretty significant idea of the range of what you're talking about. Thank you. All right. Great, thank you so much for that mm -hmm. lightning round. Um, this has been a, a really good discussion and um, full of lots of really helpful information. So thank you, Treasurer Pierce, for being here with us and um, 
uh, you please stick around. We've got a few more folks to hear from. Um, so we have the chairs of the teachers board and uh, state employees board. And so uh, John and Roger, I'm going to call on you all next. Um, but just so that we all uh, um, understand the timing, we've got two other folks who are here in the meeting who I will uh, ask to, to, to share their uh, responses to the proposed um, plan design changes uh, after we hear from the, the two uh, employee board chairs. So John Harris, you are first up and um, please uh, let us know if you uh, would like us to interrupt with questions or ask you questions at the end. Um, again, I'm a, I'm a school teacher, so I'm being interrupted all the time. So if people would like to interrupt, uh, that'll be fine. Uh, so I'm still fresh from my uh, classroom experience. Um, so sure, interruptions would be great. Um, I wanna thank you, Madam Chair and uh, committee members for asking me to speak here today. I wanna start by just saying that um, the comments that I'm making today, I'm making representing myself and that um, I have not had the opportunity to speak with our board members to get any kind of um, decision or um, any message from the board. Our next meeting, as you heard, is going to be April 8th, where we'll be discussing um, the proposal and uh, possible uh, response. Um, so I wanna start with saying that I do support the influx of $150 million, the one-time payment. I think that is great. If that number could get larger, I'd even be happier. Um, I also support the uh, position of this proposal of keeping re uh, teachers that are within five years of retirement held harmless. I think that is also uh, another factor that I think is important. Um, there are a few things that um, concern me about the proposal. Um, the AFC going from three to seven is a rather drastic jump. And I worry that a move like that will, um, doesn't allow, if, if a teacher could um, and had the wherewithal to do investments to offset that loss of benefit, um, then I think that maybe that would be tolerable. But the fact is, you know, if you've got 15 years in and you're looking at 15 more, whether or not you could offset that benefit um, by investing in a 403B, I'm not sure that's attainable. Um, so that's a concern. So I would like to um, recommend dropping that number below seven, um, that that's awfully radical. Um, I, I, um, I know you heard from the two public hearings on um, the changing the normal retirement eligibility 67 is very large and many, many, many people uh, address that. Um, I just want to say that um, you remember that in 2010, the um, legislature, along with the, the parties involved, negotiated uh, changes to health care, which included um, changing to the rule of 90. So in 2010, already there had been a move for eligibility. Teachers were asked to work longer. And the other thing that I want to, I, I, I don't know if you remember, but the fact that um, the teacher plan actually has gone through three phases. We were plan A, then we went to a plan B in the 80s, and the plan B was a non-contributory that had a retirement age of 40. And I still remember this like yesterday. It's, in, it's etched in my memory. There was a hearing, public hearing in the well of the house I had about 10 years of teaching experience at that time, and I was sitting in the gallery listening to public testimony. And a, a teacher came down to testify, sat in the desk in the middle of the house chambers, sat down and said, because this was the transition, there was a, a bill to change from the plan B to plan C, which would bring back um, the eligibility to retirement back to 30 years. And this teacher sat down and looked at the members of the committee and said, I, this is my 38th year teaching. I'm a science teacher, I'm a chemistry teacher. He paused and then his voice broke and then he broke into tears and said, I can't do two more years. And that just, it, and, and the plan then changed to the plan C, contributory again, and uh, 30 years um, 
of, of uh, service. So the state tried it, it didn't work. And um, so I, I urged the committee to, to look at that. Um, the other thing, and I think you also heard this in public testimony, it, it, a current teacher that has taught for 15 years is looking to say, I've got 15 more. Well, I'll speak for myself. If, if I was still teaching and this was there, I would need to teach 45 years before I reached the age of 67. And so I chose to teach 42 years. And I did that uh, personal choice I, uh, to teach the to 42 years, 12 years beyond what I needed to, but it was a choice. I loved my job. I think the attitude of my attitude would have been a lot different in the classroom if it was mandatory that I teach 45 years. Um, so I, I really urge the committee to um, to look at that and um, and 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 really see whether or not that's that's viable and 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 whether or not that's good for kids. I and I think the health of of teachers and the welfare of kids in the classroom. I, I think that's pretty pretty um, tough. Uh, so the rule of 90, in my opinion, um, should stick. And, uh, and then there's one thing that, I, that isn't in the proposal, and um, that's a um, funding source and finding a specific funding source for the pension programs. Um, you have the one-time spending, which again, I, I totally endorse and say that's fantastic, but um, finding another source in instead of general funds um, to be earmarked specifically for the pension uh, program so that all these changes are not put on the shoulders of just uh, state employees and teachers. Um, so at that point, that concludes my uh, comments. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you, John Harris. Um, Mike McCarthy. Hi, John, thanks for being with us um, and bringing the, the teachers Board perspective. Um, you talked a little bit about the changes that were made, uh, I think a little over a decade ago. Um, and I'm wondering if you could remind us a little bit about what the contribution rate changes have been for, for teachers paying into the system over that time. Boy, I don't remember the specifics. I do remember as a young teacher, um, not understanding pensions and, and being very wet behind the ears when I saw my first paycheck saying, what's this whole thing about a pension? And why are they taking money from me? And then when I, about, I don't know, uh, probably three years into teaching, I heard news that they were going to a non-contributory system. And I'm like, I'm in. And uh, not paying to attention of the 40 years, nor at that point did I think I was going to be a teacher for 40 years. Um, and so I wasn't keeping an eye on the ball, but um, Representative McCarthy, I don't have those specifics. I'm sure the treasurer's office can provide those. Yeah, I guess I, I mean, we heard a lot yesterday that was that had to do with, um, you know, the sort of the changes that have happened over over time. And if I'm remembering right, the vast majority of teachers right now paying about 5%. Uh, and that, you know, seven, eight years ago, some of the newer teachers went up to six. Is that? That's, that's correct. That sound right? Right. And, and then back in, I, I do remember we had a number back at, you know, 3.56% or something, something around there, something in the threes. Um, so it has fluctuated and it has fluctuated up. Beth, um, you chimed back in is, do you have uh, the data on just what the recent history is in sure. employee contribution in the teacher system? Yeah. Well, John's pretty um, pretty darn close with his numbers. It was 3.54% back in uh, 2008. Um, it went up to uh, 5% uh, for all folks in 2010 or 11. I, uh, I don't have the, uh, the, 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 the implementation date in front of me but uh and then um in 2015 uh, 14 and 15 as we were uh, doing the health care piece we uh we said any new teacher um uh that was hired after 7114 or not vested or hired after 7114 would pay six percent okay that's helpful context thank you um tanya vihovsky 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, John, for being here. It's my understanding that teacher salaries haven't really kept up with the other salaries around them, which would be a net savings to the system in that we're not paying out as much of a percentage, but sort of a double hit to teachers. Is that, an, is that accurate? Say that, that salary increases haven't been- Haven't really kept up for our teachers system, which obviously is a net savings to our system because the pension would be lower if their salaries right. are lower. But if we're raising how much we're taking and lowering how much we're giving, it's kind of a double hit to our teachers who are already not really keeping up. I'm just trying to make sure that that's accurate. It's definitely accurate. And, and the reason for that is twofold. One, um, settlements are, uh, I can speak to Chittenden County. Um, because that's where I taught. And I was also involved with um, teacher uh, contract negotiations when I was an active teacher. Um, you know, settlements are were anywhere from the, the great re um, recession at one or 2%. Um, they've been averaging over the last five or six years around 3%. And that's average new money. So, you know, some people are not even making a full percent uh, increase per year. Um, and then the other thing is the increase in health care. And so um, one of the, the major ch huge change was the statewide uh, health insurance um, bargaining, and they went to high deductible plans. So you're, you're looking first dollar out of pocket. So salary increases were not there, and then uh, increases both in premium and then out of pocket costs for insurance. So there is a, a, a net result um, in terms of salaries. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, um, John. Please do stick around in case anyone else has a question they'd like to throw your way. Absolutely, it. thank you for having me. And Roger Dumas. We need you to unmute, there we go. There we go, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Madam Chair, for having me back again. It, um, I guess I might need to limit my comments pretty much to the situation of the State Employees Retirement Board at this point in time. Uh, being a retiree since 2006, I don't have a lot of input as from a state em active state employee side in response to your proposal. However, what I would like to say before I get going here is my situation with my laptop still exists as what it was last week, and hopefully it's not going to act up on me with the internet system. Uh, I apologize if it does. It, uh, but if I may, I'll keep my comments kind of brief and to the point as to the State Retirement Board and start off by saying that I'd like to emphasize the fact that the State Employees Retirement Board also recognizes that there is a pension issue. And in expression of their concern, uh, when the State Retirement Board received the treasurer's report on January 15th, as you all did as well, after much review and discussion of the potential recommendations of her report, uh, the board approved a motion by a, a vote of six to one that stated that it had received the treasurer's report and recognizes that the ADEC for fiscal year 22 and beyond may not be sustainable. As a result, recognizes that changes in the benefit level to reduce the unfunded liability may be required. So that was the initial reaction as to the board's involvement uh, relative to the proposals that we're discussing today and were addressed in the treasurer's report. Since then, I can tell you that there has been no further action by the retirement board at, uh, at this time. It, um, however, relative to the current situation as to what's been submitted by the uh, by yourself and the vice chairman as to the proposals dealing with pension issues and calculation of pension benefits. Uh, I must reiterate what I said last week relative to the status of the retirement board that as chairman of the state board, uh, it is definitely pre premature for me to comment further 
on the proposals before us until the state board has an opportunity to convene and uh, review and discuss the proposals that have been discussed today. Uh, as you know, and I mentioned last week, uh, we anticipate the board's going to be meeting next week, and this is definitely going to be a priority issue of, of discussion. I also would like to reiterate my comment from last week is that I do appreciate that this committee has taken this matter very seriously, and I look forward to working with this committee after the retirement board gets the opportunity to review and discuss the uh, recommendations that are being talked about today. And on a personal note, if I may add, given that uh, I'm a state retiree myself, I am pleased that no changes were recommended to existing retirees benefits. This is consistent with the treasurer's recommendation as well. And I wanna thank this committee for that support. And that pretty much concludes my limited testimony today. Uh, Hopefully we'll have more to offer uh, once the, the uh, board gets to meet and discuss all the proposals before them. Thank you hey. so much. Um, questions from committee members? All right, uh, Mike McCarthy. Yeah, Roger, I, I guess I just wanted to before we move on from your testimony, acknowledge that it must have been very difficult for the state employees board of trustees uh, on, on your retirement board to acknowledge that it may be impossible in future years for the state to meet ballooning ADAC payments. I mean, I think the reason we're all engaged in a very difficult conversation about this plan is our acknowledgement that the trajectory is unsustainable. I, I just, wanted to say that, um, you know, because I think there's a, a large misunderstanding of sort of who represents and manages the pension systems that your board's primarily, uh, you know, made up of folks like you who uh, have connections to state employees or our state employee representatives. And, and that must've been a very difficult vote to make. I can only respond that you're absolutely correct. It, it, it's very challenging for the board and we recognize our role and our fiduciary responsibility. And I can just tell you that the board is very seriously involved in this matter and they recognize the challenges before us. And hopefully that we'll come out with some solutions and recommendations that'll be helpful in addressing this entire situation. Thank you, Roger. All right, um, anyone else have questions for Roger on the perspective of the State Employees Retirement System Board? All right, great. So John Pelletier, um, thank you for hanging in there and um, we've invited you to share any thoughts that you have regarding the proposed plan design changes. Great. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and uh, thank, I want to thank this committee for all the hard work they're doing. This is not an easy uh, topic. Uh, my name is John Pelletier. I'm the director of the Center for Financial Literacy at Champlain College, but I'm here today in my capacity as a member of the Vermont Business Roundtable's Pension Reform Task Force and one of the co-authors of that group's uh, 2020 report that identified some potential pension options, reform options that could be available. Uh, you know, before I go into any discussion on the reform proposal, I do want to talk to you a little bit about uh, why I, I care about this issue. Uh, I'm not against pensions, and I want to make sure people know this, particularly uh, 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 some of the the, uh, the union members that are they're on in their membership. Uh, I, I'm involved in this because I, I have been working with educators across the state. Uh, we provide at our center since 2011 free professional development opportunities for educators uh, on how to teach personal finance in the classroom. In fact, right now we're running an online on-demand free program that 500 educators across Vermont uh, are registered for and, and taking, we couldn't be happier. Uh, I've been concerned uh, since 2016 
that uh, these plans were going to have problems. And uh, it was pretty clear to me, perhaps given my uh, uh, institutional background and money management, that the funding ratios of these plans were too low, the assumed rate of return was too high, and that it was inevitable that we were going to have a recession and a bear market, which would negatively impact these plans. That doesn't make me Nostradamus. You know, we have recessions and we have bear markets every decade. Uh, they, they happen. And, and we weren't improving uh, enough since the previous Great Recession uh, and, and, and more needed to be done. Uh, a funded ratio of 51% for the teachers is, you know, frankly, unacceptable. Uh, once you start getting into the 40s, it's almost unsustainable. Uh, it's terrible for the state. It's terrible for the taxpayer. Uh, but ultimately, it's, it's terrible for the teachers. Uh, and so that's why I'm involved. I'm involved because I want to make sure that educators, whether they're uh, 10 years away, 20 years, five years, 30 years from retirement, I want them just like Beth, uh, Secretary uh, Treasurer Prius, uh, to have predictable pension benefits in their old age. I wish I had a pension. I think they're, they're, they're good things and I'm not trying to take these away uh, for, for everyone. So I I'm, couldn't be happier that my sense of urgency seems to be shared by many members uh, of this committee. I don't think you have time to wait. Uh, uh, this, this problem isn't going to get better with age. I think something uh, needs to be done and done now. Uh, as I've testified before, I 100% support Treasurer Pierce's recommendations. I support this. I just support you doing something. Something needs to be done. These, these liabilities cannot continue to grow. The uh, ADAC upside surprises cannot continue. Uh, when I talked to you in my, my last testimony, I suggested that when you look at pension reform, uh, you focus on sustainability, predictability, and affordability. I'd add to that fairness. Whatever you do needs to be fair. I would also add that for these changes to be successful, pension reforms must align economic incentives of the employer, of the employees, and the taxpayers. All of us have to want the same outcomes. And that outcome has to be a fully funded pension system because it's in everyone's long-term interest, whether it's personal, economic, or political. And so I wanna talk first about sustainability. The pension proposal from the chair and vice chair will put these plans on a path of sustainability. Currently, as we all know, these plans have nearly 3 billion in unfunded pension liabilities as of the end of fiscal year 2020. A one-time investment into these plans of 150 million should reduce based on the state's numbers that they presented, the uh, JFO's numbers, uh, should reduce the unfunded liabilities by 459 million. The cumulative impact of all of the other proposed benefit changes to the employees of the two, uh, the state employees and the teachers is about 519 million. I want people to remember, even if you do what is on the table today, your unfunded liability is still a daunting $2 billion. I mean, people are saying this is, a, this is too much. I would argue it's maybe too little, uh, uh, but at least reduces that big unfunded overhang by a third. Predictability. The pension proposal will make the annual ADEC contributions much more predictable from a budgetary standpoint. Let's remember these ADEC costs are going to continue to go up between now and 2038. Even if you do this, they're not staying flat, but they're going to be, that rate of increase is going to be more manageable. And it's much less likely if you do this plan that the General Assembly is going to be forced to make drastic cuts to other necessary services provided by the state. Affordability. The proposed changes makes the pension plan more affordable by eliminating most, not all, of that large unplanned ADAC of, uh, I think it's 96.4 million uh, for fiscal year 22 and in, and in future fiscal years. My, if my math's correct, these proposals would reduce the unplanned ADAC cost increase by about 83% in fiscal year 2022. Now I'd like to talk to you about fairness. I think that having cost sharing mechanisms in place on these plans 
is fair to the taxpayer. I don't think putting 100% of all investment, actuarial, economic, and market risk exclusively on Vermont taxpayers is fair. You, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that the only insurance company backing this plan should be the taxpayer. I think both sides need to have some skin in the game. Uh, I think fairness is impacted. Uh, I, I think fairness needs to look at this proposal very carefully in a couple of ways. First is the employees of the state of Vermont, I think should, should be asked to contribute equally, not more, to the decrease in the unfunded liabilities. That isn't what you've proposed. Currently, the employees are being asked to bear 53% of the unfunded liability reduction, while the state government is bearing only 49%. So remember, the total unfunded liability reduction proposed is 938 million, 519 million, or 53% from the employees, and 459 million would be funded by the employer, right, the state, through its one-time payment of 150 million. If you increase that one-time payment to 170 million, if my math's correct, the unfunded liability would be decreased by the state's contribution by an equal amount of 520 million. Uh, so I would suggest that you should ask both sides to pay the same and the, and, and their burden of the, of the reduction of that unfunded liability. The second fairness issue I, I'd like you to think about is I think it's not fair to equally distribute these one-time payments to the state plan and to the teacher's plan. Uh, over, over the period of 1991 to today, pretty much regularly, somehow the state plan was basically fully funded each and every year, but the teacher's plan was not. From 1991 to 2006, they missed payments of $172 million, which is, by the way, $2 million less <laughs> than the 170 I'm suggesting should be in there. Uh, I think the, uh, the teacher's plan, unlike the state plan, they had until, uh, as Beth said, I think it was fiscal year 2014, medical appropriations came out of the, their plan. Medical appropriations didn't come out of the state employees' plans. And so uh, I think you should take that into account. I think, you, you know, at a minimum, I think that, uh, you know, you've got to allocate this based on the unfunded liability. And, and just remember, the primary reasons the state employees funded ratio is 66%, while the teachers is 51%, is due to that unfunding of 172 million from 1991 to 2006, plus the, the cash that came out for the uh, healthcare costs, which didn't happen. And that's 100, that happens to be, uh, I believe, 175 million as well. Uh, so about you know, the 350 total between the two. Uh, you could argue that 100% of whatever the state's being going to put in should go uh, into, into the teacher's plan. I'm sure that wouldn't be acceptable to many people. Uh, but, but at a minimum, you should allocate it based on the outstanding liabilities. Right now, there's only 1 billion in unfunded liabilities for the state plan and 1.9 billion in unfunded liabilities for the teacher's plan. If you use that as a formula, that would suggest 35% of the one-time payment should go to the uh, state plan and 65% should go to the teacher's plan. So lastly, I wanna just go through the alignment of uh, economic interest. The, you know, look, we, the General Assembly and the governor will not wanna have any more unplanned increases of materiality, right, in the ADAC, that's going to result in cuts to future essential programs. So their, uh, their alignment is let's fully fund. The employees in these plans won't want to have the cost sharing mechanisms be triggered. The employees in these plans have every incentive to get the full COLA on all their pensions by getting that funded ratio in excess of 85% as soon as practicable. How do you get there? Make these, these plans much more fully funded. 
taxpayers are not going to support major increases in their tax taxes or decreases in essential services for the state to provide retirement and healthcare benefits that less than 15% of private sector workers nationally even have access to. I've attached to my testimony a December 2020 uh, uh, congressional research report um, uh, that shows that only 15% of private sector workers nationally have access, but many of those where access is available, it's in places where the pension shut down to, to new employees. Only 11% of employees who are currently working are actually taking advantage of it. I mean, I'd love to have a pension. I'd love to have the, these, these benefits, are, they're expensive. There's a reason corporations don't offer them. It's not because they're cheaper to offer uh, than, 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 than uh, a 401k. Uh, and again, I'm not trying to get rid of them, but let's just be realistic. There's, they're expensive. Uh, I think we want to get to a point with whatever you do that all stakeholders are going to demand conservative and realistic assumed rates of return, actuarial assumptions, and more importantly, all will demand above median performance from the managers of these pension plans. And so that's what we need. And I think your plan goes a long way with it, uh, particularly if we enact some level uh, of uh, uh, governance reform uh, on this, whether it's governance or VPIC. And frankly, I think the question should be what governance reform does the General Assembly need to make to make sure that they're much more aware of what's going on than they have been in the past. I, I don't think just getting a bill to the Appropriations Committee once a year is appropriate. So uh, when you look at governance, don't just look at VPIC. Uh, I, I, I ask you, look at what can the General Assembly be doing to make sure that uh, these issues are uh, addressed. We need a watchdog on the watchdog and if he picks the watchdog, you're the watchdog on the watchdog as the General Assembly. So anyway, that, that's, that, those are my remarks. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, John. Um, I, I really appreciate, and it resonates with me, the way you have sort of outlined um, you know, markers of fairness and, uh, and, and where to allocate um, uh, shared uh, sacrifices or shared input into the fix here. So um, thank you for your thoughts on that. Tanya Bihovsky has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, John. Um, I actually have two questions. One um, is if I'm curious if you would say that there's a fundamental difference between a public state pension system and a private retirement system. Um, not, not in terms of, of the, the promise, right? Uh, not, not in terms of the fact that they're, they're both trying to give people uh, uh, kind of a, a, an income stream. It's almost like an annuity, right? You got to think about it. It's like an annuity, a lifetime an annuity. And, and both of them are trying to do that. Uh, and, and that's, I'm, I'm going to ignore for now uh, uh, the, 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 the healthcare benefits. Yeah, which is a which is a, which is a different thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess we're talking a lot about you know prefunding and getting out ahead of things, but a business is far more likely to go bankrupt than a state, correct? Well, yeah, I mean historically that would be true in terms of the number of public companies that go bankrupt versus states. I mean, it, you know, although you know, frankly a lot of states went bankrupt uh, in the Great Depression, and people forget that. Uh, in fact, quite a few. Uh, so it depends on you know what economic scenario you're 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 pointing to. Okay, um, that's that's helpful. It just as I'm thinking about it, you know, a lot of the prefunding is really to protect employees, in my understanding, so that if a business goes bankrupt, they still get what they were promised. And so I'm just trying to understand how these systems fundamentally function differently. No, they don't necessarily get 100. percent There's a pension benefit guarantee corp that that bills people out up to a certain percentage, but they don't get 100 percent if they go bankrupt. Okay. Uh, the other thing I'd point out is. You know, frankly, um, FASB and GASB, which are the accounting standards, FASB applies to corporations, GASB applies to governments. Uh, they don't use identical uh, requirements uh, with regard to uh, how you determine uh, liabilities and what you're supposed to do from the accounting treatment of pension plans. We hold uh, in this country uh, companies to a much higher standard than, than governments. And, there are things that occur uh, in pension plans. For example, we did select an ultimate for four years from 
I think 2011 to 2015, that would be illegal under FASB. It is legal under GASB. So there, there are lots of differences between the two uh, and, and states, uh, I, we, we put rules in place where you've got to get these things pretty fully funded. They've got to be reflected on your, your, your P&L as a company. Uh, there's much more incentive for companies to uh, have uh, fully funded pension systems in states, in all honesty. Uh, um, Thank you. And given the fluctuation and just how things move and change and how much is unpredictable, it's reasonable to assume that all pensions have at least some level of unfunded liability, correct? No, that's not true at all. Uh, there, there, there are states like uh, South Dakota uh, that uh, I think in uh, 22 of the last 28 years has been more than 100% funded. So that's not true at the state level, although most of them are. I'll, I'll give you that, but it's not a guaranteed, and that's certainly not true on the corporate level. Some are, some are not. Uh, many of them want to be as close to fully funded as possible because it negatively, if, if it can actually in, negatively impact their quarterly earnings, there, there's reasons that they have that they want to do it. Uh, that, if anything, that's the reason why many companies have gone out of it. Great. My other question is actually probably not for you and probably a larger question that I may need to find from elsewhere. Uh, you talked about the taxpayers and I'm curious what the property tax impact might be to taxpayers if we implement this plan and force higher paid teachers to stay teaching for longer, thus creating a higher cost to our school districts. Like I said, probably not a question for you, but I do want the answer. Other questions from committee members? All right. Thank you, John. Please stick around. We may have other questions that pop up after, we, um, after we've heard from other witnesses. So uh, last we have Tom Galanka with us. And Tom, I know that the Pension Investment Committee is not, um, not doesn't have a direct um, role in the setting of plan designs or, or benefit structures, but uh, I did want to invite you to share your thoughts and perspective on this. Thanks, Madam Chair. I really appreciate it. I think uh, it is important to get the investment perspective and, uh, and to kind of think about that in regards to funding and urgency in particular. You know, what, what is the urgency on this, this issue? You know, I, the question came up before you have over $5 billion, you know, what is the issue? And I, I think I can help answer that a little bit. You know, I will start off by saying I'm not here to talk about plan design. I, I really just want to talk about the impact on the investment process. And in particular, particularly, I do want to say I am a strong advocate of, of funding anything, you know, to reduce the unfunded liability. And I have a glide path to fully funding because I think it expands on the urgency that, that really investment process is made much more difficult as the unfunded liability become greater. And there's really two points I really want to emphasize with the committee that I think you should know about. You know, an unfunded liability really is an inherent, it has an inherent nature of leverage uh, that gets worse as the unfunded liability increases. And so the difficulty investment management with leverage is that small changes in any of your levers that you're looking to pull will will become more volatile. And so uh, the actuarial assumptions become more volatile. The, the not meeting the expected rate of return becomes more volatile, it becomes more pronounced. And that will continue to get worse if you don't materially change the unfunded liability of these two plans. And the second thing that I think is important as well is that there are limits on investment as it becomes more uh, unfunded. Um, we have greater need or we will have greater need for outflow of cash for, for participants that are retiring. And so currently, even with fully funding the ARC, we are funding about $150 million outflow out of the pension trust. And so that's even with you putting in the current ARC. Um, we need to get over that. We need to be able to invest the plan in a way that doesn't have these very strong outflows. If you weren't funding the ARC, you'd have an outflow of over seven or 8%, which would become significantly unsustainable. And it would accelerate that downward spiral. And so I think, you know, in terms of investment process, you know, we need to be very cognizant of the fact that there are liquidity needs and it limits our ability, it forces us really to invest in lower yielding investment choices 
and to avoid potentially some higher yielding, more illiquid investments that could benefit the state for the long run. So, you know, I just want to repeat that I, I think I'm not going to comment on which levers you're pulling, but I think pulling any levers is I do a I do a fully support, and I think uh, advocating for uh, the urgency of this need uh, is only going to get worse if we don't. And so. With that, I'll stop my conversation on investment process and I'll open up to any questions. Peter Anthony. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, both uh, Mr. Peltier and, and Tom Galanka. I, I, uh, and thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you, Mr. Galanka, you sort of hit on a piece that I was not quite uh, convinced uh, in Mr. Peltier's um, testimony. And it has to do with the equity between the funding ratio in the teacher's side and the funding ratio in the state employee side. You've reflected on that difference uh, in terms of your asset choice and level of risk. Uh, and it obviously being uh, the teachers sort of uh, foreclosing some opportunities as I think you delicately put it. Uh, what I'm trying to uh, square is a comment by Mr. Peltier that um, since at least two thirds of the unfunded liability can be laying to the um, uh, behavior attitude treatment of the teacher side of the uh, accumulating funds and the payouts. Uh, and then, the, but I think I understood Mr. Peltier say, so uh, in fairness, <clears throat> Uh, some of the levers that you choose to pull ought to take a bigger bite on the teacher's side than the state employee's side, unless I'm misunderstanding, uh, because the teacher's um, uh, history uh, of that period from, say, 1990 or so for the next uh, um, 12, 15 years uh, contributed so much to the uh, to the uh, problem, so to say. And what I'm troubled by is the translation of the accumulated under unfunded liability, which is two thirds on the teacher's side, translated from my point of view onto a benefit from state activities on the taxpayer side. So while it may be true <clears throat> that the uh, in, in and outflow on the teacher's side uh, contributed to two thirds of the unfunded liability, the taxpayers in one sense got a benefit from that because they were not funding uh, the pension. They were either not paying enough taxes or consuming resources that otherwise would have gone to the teachers. So I'm, I, I want some clarification. I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that somehow or another uh, the teachers should pick up a two thirds, if you will, uh, of the hurt from the levers uh, on that argument that uh, two thirds of the unfunded liability came on, on the teacher side of the merged funds. Uh, could you help me out with that? Well, I would, I would agree with John that there's, there is some equity there in putting money more into the teacher's fund because there have been missed payments. Whether or not you pull, how you pull those levers, I'll, I'll leave that up to you. Um, I will tell you that the teacher's plan is the one that has the biggest outflow in cash. And at VPIC, we're currently looking at potentially separating the investment policies for the three different plans because of these radically different in investment funded ratios. And, and that's kind of our next discussion level. And it will be, that will be more important in regards to the teachers because the question then is, do you, do you, how much risk capital can we put to work in the teacher's plan? And if it continues on this downward trend, we'll have to be very careful to meet that need. So I think the urgency is more in teachers um, at this point. Um, but you know, I agree with John, it, it, it's, it, it is an equity issue, but they are the ones that got the benefits from it in the past, particularly the healthcare benefit or the uh, unfunded period in the 90s. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. It, it does uh, for the most part. But if you think about the return essentially to the uh, state treasury uh, from a choice between where do you put the infusion of federal funds um, 
to keep away from the very threshold that you just articulated on the teacher's side so that you can be more aggressive on the rate of return side actually has future benefits to the fund and therefore to the taxpayers. Am I uh, reading that right? Yes, yeah, you would. Thanks. That may advocate for more of the change in the uh, expected rate of return assumption in different plans. And that's a whole different issue that I don't want to go to yet. But then, you know, it, it may advocate that we'll have to split that up where teachers would have one assumed rate of return and munis may have a different one. Well, needless to say, for administra administrative cleanliness, economies of scale and, and room to maneuver, it would be better if the funding ratios were more, more alike. Correct. That is the objective. All right. Um, other questions from committee members? Mike McCarthy. One thing that uh, it occurred to me to point out, and I'm wondering how it's related to this conversation we're having about the equity of how we put money, you know, allocate funds that we might put into the systems to shore them up this year is the equity on the contribution side. And I know that it's a little bit apples and oranges between the, the systems, but um, I'm wondering if, you know, whether this is Tom or whether it's a question for Erica, I'm not sure, but could you just talk with us about the difference between the contribution rates for in the different plans? Like we talked a little bit about teachers earlier and the changes of that historically, but I mean, I think the, the municipal well, folks pay like 11% of their paychecks, right? I can give you experience from my experience as a VMERS board member, because in, in VMERS in regards to contributions, we're not really talking about VMERS right now, but... Um, you know, contribution rates are not really considered at VPIC. You know, we, we take what we get based on what the underlying pension boards decide are the contribution rates set and with legislative legislative approval. So I don't know if I'm really an expert there. I, I, I think Eric could probably be better at it. I can, I understand the process that the Beamers board went through in terms of setting those rates and the uh, importance of annually reviewing and annually looking at whether or not it's meeting the, the normal cost. But other than that, I, I think VPIC really wouldn't be a good place to look for that answer. So Tom, um, from your experience on the VMERS board, um, I think it would just be helpful for folks to understand how frequently does the rate of um, employee contribution change on the, in the municipal system? Well, in the municipal system, our history, and, and I, I credit this to Steve Jeffrey, who used to be the chair of VMERS back, uh, back a number of years ago, uh, they would annually incrementally increase the contribution rates and try to make sure the different classes were covered with a little bit of margin to make sure that it, it had the normal cost and then it made up some of the difference um, in the uh, unfunded liability. And so the experience I had was it was an annual discussion and there was always some pressure to work uh, in concert with the unions in regards to getting it right so there's acceptance on both ends. And I credit Beth tremendously with that, that uh, she would really push with Steve Jeffrey and, and then uh, Peter Amons, who was the chair after, to, to annually have a, a regular uh, incremental increase. So it's maybe a quarter of 1% or, or, or less, uh, you know, based on the different classes, but always to look at it like that. And I, that discipline helped municipal plans stay in a, in a better funding ratio, in my opinion. Hmm. Um, Erica Wolfing at the treasurer's office. Do you have at your fingertips some of the some of the historical data that we're trying to dig into here? Sure. Um, for the record, this is Erica Wolfing, director of retirement. Um, I do have pulled up right now the historical chart for the VMERS plan rates for both the employees and the employers. Um, just to orient everyone, um, and Tom Galanco explained this, I think, pretty well, but. The employer rate is set by the VMERS board. Um, the employee rate is set by the legislature. The last time we looked at this and set incremental rate increases, we actually did a four-year plan. Um, and I believe that was back in 2017. And the VMERS board uh, voted to set the rates to increase incrementally. Um, I think it was by an eighth, an eighth, and a quarter, and a quarter over a four-year period. Um, so we're in the third year of that, I believe. So for FY21, um, and I'll talk about the employee rates first, um, we have four groups in the municipal plan. The group A, which is sort of our lower benefit group right now is contributing 3%. And our highest group, which is group D, which is law enforcement, um, firefighters, 
uh, they are contributing 11.85%. Um, so we have one more year on that four-year plan, um, and then uh, we'll reevaluate, obviously, again. Um, in terms of the historical numbers for the state plan, I'm, I'm sorry that Treasurer Pierce dropped off. She would know this way better than I do. Um, we do have a chart in the office that I was frantically trying to find. I wasn't able to, but um, my predecessor, Cynthia Webster, did keep a pretty good record of these rates, and I'm doing this from memory of that chart, so please forgive me if I misstate something, but my memory is when we made the changes in the state system in 2008, at that point in time, Group F, which you all will remember was our majority, is our majority group, that's, that's where most of our state employees fall, we're contributing somewhere in the 3.35% range. When we did the changes in 2008, it did increase. I think it went up to around 5%. And then there was another period of increase, I think sometime in the teens, I want to say 2014, 15. I'm not exactly remember, remembering how, how much it went up to, but today it's up to 6, 6, 5%. Um, and then for the group C, I think they were somewhere around 7% back in 2008. And they also increased at that, at that point and are now um, up to 8.53%. Um, but I will find that chart for all of you and, and share it. I apologize. I couldn't put my hands on it today, um, but thank you. No, no worries. Um, acknowledging that we're all um, still trying to figure out how to do our jobs remotely from home. <laughs> and I, I, I'm sure that you know exactly where it is in the office. And so if you do put your hands on that, if you could send it to our committee assistant and she can get it up under today's date. Absolutely. Great, thanks, Erica. So, committee, any other questions uh, for Tom or um, or along the lines of what we were asking from Erica at the treasurer's office? All right. Um, thank you, John and Tom, for being with us. Thank you, um, also, uh, John Harris and and Roger Dumas. Um, you, this has Pat, been. A, a Pat, Madam Chair, can I just say one thing? Sure. Uh, uh, but before we go, I, that I forgot to say in my testimony is uh, if you if you take the states in the uh, report that we did, the Vermont Table Roundtable, the, the Vermont Roundtable, and look at what states have done uh, either cost sharing or another system design, it could be DC, DB, hybrid type things, uh, 36 states have done one of those, 72% were not one of those. If you throw stress testing into the mix and look at those three categories, all but 12 states have done something. And so um, the, the, I, I, I do wanna make clear that the, the view that doing, uh, what, we, what, we're, what, you're, what your proposal is doing isn't an outlier. I would say many states are ahead of you. 72% 72 72 of states have already implemented cost sharing or some other alternative type of plan for new employees. And, and so um, it, it isn't as though, you, you know, we're zigging and everyone else is zagging. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, any final questions, committee members for any of the folks who are with us? All right, so we have um, invited Patricia Gable uh, from the Judiciary Branch to, uh, to come back because, um, Pat, when you were with us on Friday, I think at the outset you said you had about 45 minutes of testimony and, um, and we, we really only gave you probably 30 or 35 minutes. And so I wanted to make sure that we gave you an opportunity to share any other thoughts uh, that you had um, or that you have uh, relative to the response of the judiciary on the plan design that we proposed last week. Thank you, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, I did um, uh, provide you a memo that I think only just uh, was posted on your website that supports my testimony, but I realize nobody's probably had a chance to look at it, so I'll uh, quickly uh, go through that. And um, this memo uh, talks about the impact of the proposed changes in Group D on um, existing uh, judges in the judiciary. And we um, did hear uh, from the committee that uh, Group D was uh, 
added to the proposal, not because it achieved uh, savings toward the underfunded liability, but rather for purposes of equity. And so we wanted to address the equity outcomes um, of the proposal. <clears throat> so uh, as you'll see when you have a chance to look at the memo, uh, one of the unfortunate aspects of the proposal is that it has a disproportionate impact on the sitting uh, female judges. <laughs> and, um, and so what it does is it creates a group of haves and a group of have nots, if you will, in the judiciary that are not based on years of service, uh, but rather simply um, their age. And so uh, given the fact that the, um, there's no financial savings, um, we're seeking to understand better what the um, idea was behind the proposals. Um, the current proposal affects seven of, uh, of the 10 people uh, who are women. So we have 10 affected trial judges, seven of them are women. And to give you an example of the ways that uh, this, the proposal works right now, two current judges appointed at the same time are treated very differently simply as a matter of their age. Judge number one, could serve another seven years and receive a pension benefit of uh, 0 0.0333 times 12 times last year's salary. And judge number two needs to serve another 15 years to age 67, at which time she will receive a benefit that's calculated in a very different way and uh, to her detriment. There are at least for instances of this kind of inequity that uh, result from the proposal. One of the uh, affected judges um, gave me a note explaining what her situation's like. And she said, she's a 53 year old female judge. She has 10 years on the bench. She has more experience on the bench than 20 other judges. All of them appointed after her. Uh, she's not eligible for the current retirement benefits under your proposal, but six of her male colleagues, all appointed after her, will be eligible for their current benefits. Um, of the 10 judges who will be penalized as ineligible for current benefits, as we said, seven of them are women. And she notes that she's not at the point where she can earn extra income because judges are not permitted to have other sources of income while they're working. And the proposal delays hers, but not her male colleague's retirement to age 67. So that's one example. The, the proposal also has a discouraging impact on recruiting from the, the ranks of lawyers in public service, some of whom were required to cash in their 401k balances in order to have the um, Judge D pension plan. And so um, she, this judge sent me information on that. And she said she started working in the state's attorney's office in August of 1994. She was uh, almost 25 years old. She was sworn in as a judge in February of 2016 when she was 47 years old. She learned as a part of that transition that she would have to trade in her existing retirement benefits um, and uh, invest in the Group D pension plan. Under the present pension proposal, she'll need to work another 15 years as a judge in order to retire without incurring a penalty. And she's only now just turned 52. In contrast, another colleague, who was sworn in after she was, will only have to work 12 more years to retire without a penalty. And she did share with me the um, correspondence she had with the treasurer's office about the impact of um, the letter from the treasurer about the impact of this trans, uh, transaction. And the treasurer's letter does tell her what her pension will be as a result of this trade-off that she's made. 
And so again, um, judges in that position uh, who've made that uh, change uh, because of their change in status um, are being penalized by the proposed plan. Uh, we're concerned that the proposed plan not only um, works in equities among the existing judges, but it's uh, a discouraging um, element uh, when we're trying to recruit more women judges. We've been recently more successful, um, which is a great thing. And we're also trying to recruit more judges who have um, diversity, show diversity in terms of the kind of law they practice so that uh, we have that diversity which reflects the diversity of cases that are actually tried um, in the judiciary. I think I mentioned to the committee last time because we don't have subject matter expertise in the judiciary regarding pension plans that we're in the process of engaging a pension expert so that we can work with you and others uh, to look at pension design related to judges uh, so that we could uh, develop um, an analysis that makes sense and make sure that the pensions for judges not only continue to help us recruit uh, the best and most well-qualified lawyers to be judges, um, but also uh, that we'll be able to retain our existing judges. Uh, the years of service that they have are really important resources for us. Thank you for um, coming back and sharing uh, your additional thoughts and, and we'll encourage the committee to take a look at the memo that uh, has been posted. Uh, John Gannon. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and thank you, uh, Patricia, for testifying today. Um, how much uh, judicial turnover is there? I mean, how many judges leave for other jobs um, other than other judicial appointments? So thanks to the pension plan uh, that's in place, and I think also because of, in general, a successful recruiting in terms of the commitment of people who apply, there has been up to this point relatively little turnover where judges leave uh, to go to other jobs because the pension plan enables them to um, enjoy the independence and the security so that they don't have to uh, seek other employment or, or keep their eyes out for the future. And one of our concerns is that depending on how the pension plan may be changed, that could really change that factor. And how many vacancies are there currently for um, judicial positions? So the vacancies for judicial positions are a factor of our budget. And so when, um, when we need to um, uh, realize vacancy savings in order to meet budget objectives, and this happens in particular when the governor uh, doesn't uh, fully fund our current needs, we will manage vacancies that way. Right now, there is one position that's vacant in the judiciary, and it's in the process of going through the judicial nominating board in the appointment process. And how many applicants do you get for that position? Well, so they don't come to us. Uh -huh. And so what happens is um, we, we actually have no role directly <laughs> in the recruitment of judges. Um, there's a, a judicial nominating board process. And I think I might've mentioned it a little bit the last time. Some members of the board are uh, appointed by the legislature, some by the executive branch, and some by the Bar Association. I might not have that exactly right. And uh, there's a statute uh, that defines what well-qualified means. And then uh, the judicial nominating board, um, in, on a confidential basis, uh, accepts applications when a vacancy is posted to be filled. And they send up to the governor uh, those names that they find are well qualified. And I also think I mentioned the last time, uh, a number of years ago, the three branches of government got together to express concern about the lack of diversity uh, on the candidates put, being put forward. And as a result of that, recently, we've seen more diversity, both in terms of uh, gender, but also in terms of 
practice area group. So we've considered that up to this point a success, a recent success. Great. I believe you said one judge had to give up their 401k to, to get their pension. Can you explain that a little more? Yes. I can understand they have to stop contributing to their 401k because they're changing jobs, um, but I don't exactly understand why they had to give it up. Yes, they were. Yeah, you know, for and, and again, remember, I'm not a pension subject matter expert, but uh, I do have the letter in front of me that uh, told her she had to do that. And essentially what it said is for um, her to transition into the Group D pension plan, it required her to convert her existing uh, retirement uh, contributions. Uh, I think actually she first had to go into Group F and then buy time into Group D. And so she was um, definitely um, in that case uh, making an exchange for um, the pension benefits she had. Uh, I see you shaking your head. So you are the subject matter expert, so I won't. Uh, no, I, I, I just, I, I'm not following, I'm sorry. I mean, go ahead. I mean, um, you're not, you don't understand why? Well, I think I, I partially do, but if she, if she was in a group F, then she was in a pension. No, what she had was a, a 401k and uh, let me just review the letter that she was sent by the treasurer's office. Um, Bought time? Yes, yeah, so well, it's like she had to do a couple of different things. She was in a 401k, first she had to transfer into group F, and then uh, I imagine she's buying time now to go into group D. And uh, at the time, uh, they told her what the calculations would be and what she would get at the end of that transition. And uh, she's not the only judge, uh, because we have a number of judges who've come from uh, public service. And so when they make those changes and those exchanges, they do receive uh, an estimate for what that will mean in terms of their group D service. Okay. So I see someone else shaking their head, but I got the letter right here. Just write a check. Well, that's, uh, I guess there are people in the state who can do that, but lawyers who work in public service uh, normally don't have that um, luxury. So Peter Anthony has a question. Thank you. <clears throat> Pardon me, a couple. Could you, since we actually just... Uh, the committee uh, just was inquiring about the variation in the contribution rates funding what are called the normal costs. What is the contribution rate in for, let's say, a sitting uh, trial judge? Well, I'm looking at the chart uh, that was, I think, uh, may have been in either one of your exhibits before your committee or in the uh, pension report. And so uh, under Group D, it says employee contributions, 6.65% of gross salary. Great. Thank you. So that's, that's sort of in the ballpark. Because uh, as you mentioned, um, part of the proposal uh, you typified as being not to save money in the case of the judiciary, but for equitable purposes. And I want to dig a little deeper into that um, uh, conclusion. Um, if the um, plan that is on the table from the committee uh, doesn't happen, could you uh, point out whether there are aren't any internal inequities as the situation is? And I, let me say what piqued my ears was your description of a um, female who started in the judiciary at age 25, ascended to the bench in the 40s, in her 40s, and then uh, be, if the changes happened, would be required to work way longer than a male counterpart. And I guess I'm uh, our plan aside, I, I just wonder what the, um, if you like, deviation between years on the bench, um, obtaining full benefits and the years essentially that one has 
participated uh, and contributed. Uh, it's sort of a, a, a benefit value given um, the um, projected mortality rates also between male and female, as opposed to the kind of uh, years of service that someone has put in. And I'm wondering, would you say that there aren't any inequities in the judicial branch and you could divide it by men and women or not. Uh, could be people who join early as opposed to people who come to the bench later in life um, um, without the plan. I, I, if the argument yes, is you're trying to create, you, you the committee don't understand the judiciary and so your attempt to bring equity to it is misplaced. Uh, my question back is, is there any inequity that you could help me out with under the current situation without any changes that the committee has on the table? So with, uh, I just wanted to correct one thing you said. Um, uh, that example of that judge, it, she didn't join the judiciary at that young age. She was in public service. She was a state's attorney at that age. And so she, that's how um, she was entitled to the state, you know, the 401k. And so um, right now, uh, the, what happens in the judiciary is uh, people join, they're appointed to the bench, uh, they vest uh, in five years. But when they vest in five years, it's uh, really um, a, you know, at a lower rate. And so they have to serve 12 years to get the specially designed judge pension plan. And so even though technically they vested in, in group D at year five, it's based on the years from the appointment to the bench. Your proposal um, combines a very serious diminution of benefits when you collectively put them together with an age cutoff. And it's the uh, age uh, cutoff that um, in combination with this very serious change in benefits that, at, that um, causes uh, the inequities because it, what a person's age is, um, is kind of arbitrary in, term, in terms of when they joined uh, the judiciary. So that means someone who's older but had fewer years of service could do better than someone who's younger and has more years of service. And so, oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, and I was gonna say, you know, so in terms of um, uh, equities, I think the pension plan, uh, if I understand it, is neutral in that regard, the current one. Uh, thank you. Is, it, it, do I have it right that the benefit level uh, relative to the last year or two uh, years of service is at, uh, what, 100% or 80%? Yes, yeah, so the, the, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. There's, there's no, a little bit of a delay, so I'm, I'm not <laughs> jumping in. Um, the, the, the theoretical uh, level is 100%. And it is true that if someone is in public service long enough, whether they're in the judiciary or in one of those plans that tax on, it's theoretical pop theoretically possible for someone to reach that. And in fact, over the years, there have been uh, a few judges who have reached that. Uh, however, uh, I, I mentioned to you, our most recent history is that the average age of people joining the uh, bench is in the mid fifties now. And unless that average age, age drops back again, uh, the chances that someone actually um, does reach that will it, it's not impossible, but it's less likely. The other thing I wanted to mention is we, um, as you know from my testimony last week, we are anxious to see data and to understand. And we don't, because we don't manage uh, pensions in the judiciary, in order for us to see and analyze the data, we do need the access to the information that the actuaries have so that uh, we could engage and we're, you know, as I've said, we're you know, really willing to engage in a problem solving approach uh, to um, meet the um, objectives 
uh, of having good pension plans uh, for all state employees, including uh, the judges. Uh, but we, we will need access to that data. And uh, I trust that once our um, pension expert is on board, we'll be able to do that. And I think we'll be better partners with you uh, once we, we do have that. I certainly hope so. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say we're trying to be good partners. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, no, I, I very much appreciate that. And, um, you know, I was, uh, I was surprised when, when you first came to join this discussion that you noted that you had never been invited to have uh, part in these dialogues in the past, because um, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense when, uh, when you are an equal branch of government. Yeah, so after the treasurer's proposal came out, I did contact the treasurer uh, so that I could understand better what um, was in the proposal regarding uh, group, group D in particular. Obviously we have many group F members. And so um, it's easier for us because we have the benefit of the, of the report uh, to you know, better understand the impact. You know? Yeah. Bob Hooper has his hand up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm spinning around, not really knowing what question I'm going to ask, but as to the last point that you made, and I'm glad you brought it up because it reminded me of something. Um, the last time there was a payment or a contribution increase for the judicial branch, um, the judicial branch was brought in and consulted. The administrative judge was approached who went to the chief judge's Supreme Court, I understand, and got the approval to move forward with it. I know that because I'm the person that went to him. Um, I think Representative Gannon's conversation that eventually came out, we were talking about a state's attorney. I think it's a, a weird flummox in the process, but to go from a defined contribution sort of 401 to a plan F to a plan D uh, would be elective and not forced to. So the last question I'm left with, uh, Pat, if I may, do you have any idea what the unfunded liability attributed to the Plan D people is in the grand scheme of the state's obligation? No, that was my first question uh, for the when I first met with the treasurer, and we've continued to try and find that out. Um, and I'm not I'm not um, you know saying there's anything wrong with the fact that uh, she didn't have that information for me. But obviously, you know, again, to understand and to engage in some good problem solving, we would need to understand that, you know, is there a shortfall? And if it is, what is it? And what does that mean for pension design? I am, judges? I am tremendously happy that we agree on something at the end of our period here. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Other questions from committee members? All right, well, thank you so much for coming back and I look forward to continuing this dialogue. Um, it's helpful for us to, um, you know, to, to include all parties in uh, being part of this conversation. So thank you. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to meet with you at a time that wasn't as challenging as the end of the day on Friday. <laughs> Thank you very much for giving me. Believe me, I know what you mean. <clears throat> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, committee. Um, that I think I'm going to call that a wrap for the day. I do want to have some time for us to have a committee discussion um, just to sort of um, reflect on what we've heard um, in the different public hearings that we've held and uh, and what we've heard in our community meetings with constituents. I know that I have met with a couple of dozen um, um, teachers and state employees in my communities um, over this past weekend. And um, But I think before we do that, hold on, let me let Sam back in. Um, and before we do that, I think it would be helpful to give folks um, enough time to read through the um, all of the written testimony that was submitted by um, 
by the folks who testified as well as by the uh, other folks who were not able to testify because they had a schedule conflict or um, or because uh, our we had hit capacity. So um, uh, our committee assistant has now forwarded all of those emails in I think three batches so far and will continue to um, compile and send along as more come in. And so I guess I would just ask you all to take some time to look through the uh, the the documents that were emailed and are now on our committee page, and um, and we will schedule some time either tomorrow or Thursday to to just explore some of the observations, some of the uh, common ground maybe that we can all agree upon in terms of what the landscape looks like. Um, and uh, I think that will be a very helpful committee discussion as well to think about the lingering questions that each of us has that we'd like to get answered in order to feel like we fully understand what's going on. Peter Anthony. I appreciate it, Madam Chair. And you could see from this uh, most recent uh, give and take, uh, I, I like Ms. Gable, uh, am not having any luck uh, with uh, group-based equity kinds of questions. And that, that simply goes to the, my worry that pulling a lever, not understanding how it affects different groups really, uh, really uh, undercuts my confidence in, in, in quotes, my doing the right thing. And I, I, I don't know where to go with that. I've, I've already said, I'd, I'd love to move on things that I'm fairly sure uh, are fair, partly address the problem, and are relatively simple to understand. But the intra-group, intergroup, excuse me, but intrastate employee kinds of issues that I keep running into when I ask probing questions give me less and less confidence of pulling a big lever that affects four or five groups in ways that I don't even understand. Um, and indeed, Ms. Gable may not understand because she doesn't have the data. Uh, neither do I have the data, <laughs> so I'm 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 kind of nonplussed by that, Madam Chair. But mm -hmm. thank you for indulging me. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or urgent comments from committee members? Mike Berwicki. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I see that tomorrow uh, we have some other things, and I'm just going to ask if I could have a couple of minutes. To, to talk about some of my ideas tomorrow. Um, we are putting ideas on the table on Thursday morning. Tomorrow, we're gonna come back to some governance focus, unless what you are asking is, could you put a governance proposal on the table? Uh, it's in that realm. Okay, let's, uh, let's connect on that and we'll make sure we find the right time for you to do that. Thank you. Any other questions from committee members? Uh, Tanya Vihovsky. Thank you, Madam Chair. As we are discussing governance proposals, can I ask that we reach out, is Patricia's not still here, um, uh, to some of the best practice. She said she had people that could speak to governance best practices and I'd love to have them be part of that conversation. Um, yes, we have been trying to uh, to find those experts, and we have indeed had contact with some of them. Um, and I think you'll find that uh, one of the folks who's testifying tomorrow is someone who has uh, an understanding of different governance systems around the country uh, in different public pension programs and uh, can speak a bit to the issues around uh, best practice. Thank you. Any other thoughts, questions, comments before I spring you so that you can go do your homework maybe outside on a sunny afternoon? <laughs> Representative LeClaire, are you shaking your head about doing your homework outside or about doing your homework at all? <laughs> no, I totally agree with doing the homework outside, Madam Chair. Okay. <laughs> Good. I just wanted to make sure we were we were all on the same page. Um, 
but uh, you know, I'll just echo the thanks um, and gratitude that that you guys are hanging in here on a really deep and really complex um, discussion uh, topic. And it would be um, uh, it it would be easy to to say that if the answers were simple, we would have done it by now. Um, but that that reality is really striking home for me as. Um, as we peel back the layers of this problem and, and try to understand how the equitable solutions um, might come together. So thank you all and have a good afternoon um, reading through all of the, the documents. That